Hello, everyone. So it's been brought to my attention that a spectre is haunting the world of apologetics YouTube. The spectre is not communism, it's consciousness. We seem to have so many of these videos about consciousness and how it proves God or Christianity or debunks materialism or something. Um, and another one of them has appeared on Cameron's channel, an uh, not an argument, a discussion that he had with Joss Rasmussen, I think at his conference last year. Um, interestingly, this video here seems to be the origin of Cameron's post a few days ago, the community post that is about uh, Cameron thinking that it's broadly logically impossible for the uh, material world to ground the mind or something to that effect. So I think we, we get a bit of insight into what he means there in this video. So we're going to look at this video today and I'm going to provide my commentary on it. Uh, I have a particular interest in these arguments about consciousness or the mind uh, because of my research. And I also think that this sort of area is quite interesting because it's one of the areas where you really see the intersection of science and philosophy. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, I think it's interesting to see how this is inc seemingly increasingly being used as an argument um, for broadly theistic worldviews. So we're going to look at this video today. Uh, a few initial comments. So this is a 40 minute video. Um, I understand Joss is providing some commentary based on a book that he is either has written or will write. I'm a little unclear about that. I haven't read either of the books that are mentioned here actually now that it comes to think of it i don't know that these are actually the books that are mentioned by josh in the uh in the talk uh, in the discussion he mentions that he's written a book on consciousness but i'm not sure if that's come out yet anyway so the point is that he may well go into more detail in that that i don't cover here uh that's fine i'm i'm reviewing the video 40 minutes is enough time to give a decent amount of background and depth into things so i again i think wouldn't say that i expect everything to be covered of course but uh 40 minutes is enough to to provide some decent arguments so i'll be critical where i think criticism is due welcome to uh welcome to those in chat all right um i don't think there's any other background i want to provide so let's just make a start here hey guys welcome to capturing christianity my name is cameron bertuzzi and today i'm here in person with josh rasmussen none other than josh rasmussen who is a very good friend of mine and this is the first time that we're actually meeting in person i'm super excited to finally actually like meet you in person. What's funny yeah, is that you. I picked you up at the, the hotel just now and you were like, Cameron, I was entertaining this hypothesis that you were a green alien. And there's no one else on, on the planet, I don't think, that would say that to someone. Like, well, it was exciting that the hypothesis was disconfirmed before my eyes. But when I shared that with you, you had this look like, Josh, are you serious? <laughs> that was my thought too. Yeah, well. Oh, we should probably mention what we're actually talking about in this interview, which is we're talking, the title is, is kind of fluid, but we're discussing whether or not you are more than material. Are you just your physical body? Are you more than your material? Is there something distinct between you and your mind or your thoughts? So yeah, that, that's what we're yeah. And it applies about. not just to you, but also to you, Cameron, and to me, uh, presumably, right? So, so if, if any person is more than material, then presumably all the others, all the other human persons are also more than material. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. So it would extend not just to, but yeah. to everybody. Because everyone's thoughts are, or experiences. I suppose, is that something that we're assuming? I don't want to actually get on a, a tangent because that makes me think immediately about Kleinian's thesis that you know there's no good arguments for other minds. Well, so this is a nice point because I was just going to say that many of these arguments about the nature of persons, the nature of consciousness starts from the first person perspective. So you start thinking about my consciousness, mm -hmm. my thoughts. That's where you have, you have the most access to your own thoughts, your own feelings. And then after that, it becomes a further question whether the results of your analysis apply to yourself, apply to other people. And there are some interesting philosophical puzzles about how to extend that analysis. But um, usually you can get pretty confident about what's true about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can see that in others. Yeah. Oh, I should also mention that we're filming this at the CCV1 conference. I probably should have mentioned that at the beginning, but I'll just mention it now. This is our first conference we've ever done in person. Got an amazing lineup of speakers. And uh, hopefully this is just the first of many conferences we'll do. But I'm just super, super excited about uh, being here and, and being able to do this and, and meet so many of you guys in person. So let's, uh, yeah, let's get into the nitty gritty details. The production quality is really good for these interviews, <laughs> I, I must say. Although I'm not a big fan of the background. It looks like someone's lost a tin of paint or two there. I, I guess that's just a style, eh? whatever. But the... Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the camera work and the lighting and everything is just excellent. So uh, props to that there. I know that Cameron uh, works as a photographer, so uh, good to see top-notch Do you even have there. some props for us? Should we get directly into those? I, I think so. I think it's helpful to start with a concrete example. So, you know, this is a, a nice concrete bit of reality here, okay. this Lego piece. Yep. And you like to use props in your videos. Yeah, well, this kind of helps us to think about these theoretical issues. We can sort of anchor them down to something we can see, we can touch, we can feel, 
And I was thinking... Now you make me want to feel one. Can I have... Yeah, I've got a few one? others. You can okay. play with these. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can now build. I'm not going to be listening to what you're saying. Just well, you know, I mean, one question that you might ask is, um, would it be possible to build a thought using uh -huh. Legos? Now, let's just assume for sake of argument. Now, this is a bit immature of me, but uh, I guess it's just an accent thing. But when Josh and Cameron say thought, to me, it sounds like they're saying thought, <laughs> which is rather a different video uh, discussion that they have, I suppose. But I just find it a bit <laughs> a bit amusing every time that they say that. So, so I have to keep reminding myself they're talking about thoughts, not thoughts. But anyway, let's keep going. Argument that this Lego is not right now a thought and it doesn't have thoughts. Okay, now I know that's a grand assumption. But if we think of this as an example of a merely material object, mm -hmm. then we can characterize it in terms of third-person properties like shape, um, position, and space, its color. And none of these properties would be uh, thought-like. They wouldn't have the property of being about you. They wouldn't have the properties that thoughts would have. So you might think this thing is not thinking in and of itself. Okay? But then there's this question, could we build a thought? So let's take some other pieces here. Um, let's say, you know, this isn't thinking. But like if we add this piece, are these together thinking? Uh, what do you think? What, what, what I think? Yeah, do you think that we could build a thought by stacking these Legos up together? Um, and we change the color? Yeah, so in these types of situations, my initial reaction is just like, obviously no. Okay. Obviously can't be done. Why, why are you thinking that? Because the building blocks, that's, it's probably like a, has to do with some kind of construction error, so that we don't have the right materials. Yeah, wrong materials, yeah. yeah. And we can zoom in on this, and we can think about, well, why are these the wrong materials? Okay. And there's three different theories that we can have about consciousness, hmm. and we can apply it to these materials, and then this will help us to think about other materials, such as maybe like this material here, mm -hmm. or maybe this material, <laughs> or maybe if we cut open this material, we find other material, and we see, is there a relevant difference between these materials and these materials, okay? So would you like me to run through those three theories? All right, I think that's a good place to pause it there. So um, we'll get a bit more on this, obviously, going forward, but I, I think the, the props are interesting. I mean, I don't mind the use of props, but... I, I think that the way they're characterizing this is misleading at the outset, right? At least from my point of view, because the, the insofar as there is a mainstream view, the mainstream view in, let's say, cognitive science and, and really philosophy of science as well, or at least a very, very popular view is called functionalism. Joshua will mention that a little bit later. Functionalism is essentially the idea that what makes something a thought or what makes it about something else or, um, even arguably consciousness, although maybe that's a bit of a different issue. Uh, but what, what makes, let's say, a thought, a thought or a mental process, the mental process it is, is the function that it carries out. So basically like how it works. So um, you can think about language, for example. There's a whole bunch of mental, you know, computations and representations we have that we use to facilitate language that happens when we're thinking and then producing language. But but the point is that that, that performs a particular function. Like we want to say, um, or ask someone a question or give them a command or, or tell them a piece of information. There's a particular function that we as a person are carrying out, but there'll also be functions within our mind, like a, one particular, um, I guess, uh, pa a pattern of activity in our brain represents one particular concept and another one represents another. And they're sort of defined in virtue of the, the functions that they carry out in the mental space. Um, that's kind of vague, but the, the, without getting into too much detail there, the point that I want to make there is that functionalism emphasizes the function that... Um, some mental process or even a, a part of the brain or a brain network or something, the function that it performs in, say, the cognitive system as a whole. Now, the key there is that function is is determined by the structure that underpins that function, but it's not um, it's not the same as that structure. And, and importantly, you can have the same function realized or implemented it by different structures. So uh, a way to see this that's a bit outside the the space of the mind, just for illustration, is an eye, right? So an eye is a, an organ that has a function of basically transducing electromagnetic radiation into a pattern of signals that's useful for the survival of the organism, right? So vision, essentially. Now, there are commonalities in the structure of eyes, you know, that they're all going to have to have some photoreceptors some molecules that uh, change shape, essentially, in, in response to um, interacting with electromagnetic radiation, and then they're going to have to transduce that signal into uh, electrical patterns that, that are sent to the brain and so forth. But there are many different types of eyes that have evolved. There's like uh, mammalian eyes, there's the um, eyes, uh, I think it's the octopus or the squid has that are like inverted with respect to ours. There's the compound eye of insects and a whole bunch of others as well. So eyes have evolved a number of different times and different levels of complexity. So the point is here, different structures, very similar function. And that's the case for many other types of organs and organ systems as well in biology and at the right from the protein level up to the, the, um, the population level of ecosystems and things like that. So similarly, we can say with respect to the mind, the point there is the function being carried out um, the cognitive function, like whatever the task is, be it memory, problem solving, 
executive function, emotion, um, control of appetite, uh, language, whatever it is. It's the function that's being carried out. So the relevance of this to what Josh is saying is that when he's talking about very, uh, I guess, what I would call as like highly concrete structural elements, he mentioned color and shape and things like that, and he's moving these blocks around. You're thinking about, I think that's thinking about this in the entirely wrong way. Obviously, the structure will matter for what functions are performed. But if you're thinking, if you want to start from the mind, you should talk about and think about it in terms of what functions are being performed and then ask how can we implement those functions. Obviously, if we, if we, um, go about it and try to build the wrong set of Legos, if you like, then we're not going to fulfill the right functions. But there are maybe many, many ways of implementing those functions, like of implementing a system that can produce language or many ways of building an eye. So what we should be thinking about, I think, is what are the substrates or what are the ways that we could implement the, the functions of cognition? Um, but by focusing on a very sort of uh, superficial characteristics like shape and size and color, I think you, you kind of completely miss the point uh, about the functional side of things. And you instead are focused on the structural elements and you kind of miss the whole point, which is, well, what function is it is it carrying out? Obviously, a bunch of blocks like that is not going to be thinking or seeing or experiencing anything because it doesn't have the right, it, it doesn't perform the right uh, functional uh, tasks. It, it, it doesn't have the right um, characteristics to perform the functions needed for uh, cognition, like not even close. So um, it, it's not really about the shape or the size or things like that. Those will matter, but only insofar as they affect the function, right? So uh, at this point, this is not exactly, like this is not exactly a problem with Josh's argument per se, because it, that's just an analogy, but it's more like I see it as he's kind of going in the wrong direction. And, and because a lot of his arguments are essentially appeals to intuition or like introspective evidence, uh, by using these concrete examples to try to uh, tap your intuitions in a certain way, I, I think it's going to be misleading. And I think we'll see this mistake sort of, what I regard as a mistake compounded over the course of the discussion where he's using language and, and metaphors, which are inviting you to think about cognition in a certain way, as if it's uh, somehow thoughts are just like a bunch of blocks stacked together, which, and, and then if you change the orientation or color or shape of them, then, well, obviously that's not going to change whether or not they can think, but, but that's thinking about it the wrong way. The question is, what are the functions that we, we need to, um, carry out or that needs to be carried out for cognition, like what functions do these different uh, cognitive tasks perform, like language or memory or whatever? And then what are the different ways of implementing those potentially? And we can talk about those. How might they be implemented in the human brain? How might they be implemented hypothetically in um, an electronic computer? I'm not saying those are conscious now, but you know how some, some cognitive tasks can be carried out by electronic computers. Maybe in the future more will be able to. How might they be able to be implemented in a different type of nervous system? Right, and and so then I, I think we're focused on the right questions, which is the the function and structural implementation, and not thinking of, and not this misleading idea about whether blocks are arranged in the right way. That that's an entirely structural focus. So I hope that was was kind of clear. Again, so the, the main point there is when we're talking about cognition and these different cognitive functions or tasks, we should be thinking about what functions they perform, how do these functions relate to each other, um, and then how can we implement those? Like how could they work essentially? Um, not just like what how do you like build a, a tower out of bricks? And if you rearrange the bricks, it's still not conscious. Like that, that that's misleading because it's it, it's missing the functional element, which which is critical there. Anyway, I, I hope that kind of gets the point across. We'll, we'll talk more about this as we go. Let's continue with the video series. Yeah, this is surprisingly blowing my mind already. Okay, this is so, great. Well, because one of my methods as a philosopher, as a truth seeker, is to start with what's clearest. Mm -hmm. So I think for most people, it's pretty clear that this thing is not thinking just in virtue of its geometric uh, and color attributes. Mm -hmm. That's pretty clear. Okay, but now we can zoom in. We can try so to understand why that is. You just mentioned yeah. color and geometric shape. So shape and color. But what about like you know the substance, the chemical properties that it's made of? Maybe that's, the, the, that makes a difference. Yeah, we can we can cut this apart. We can we can cut this in half. You know, I don't have the so maybe, instruments, but we could we could decompose it into its most basic atomic parts. Yeah. Well, maybe, yeah. my I guess my thought is maybe it's because we don't like maybe it is the case that a certain type of I don't know brain material, whatever the chemical chemistry makeup is. Yeah. Like that is what could be conscious. So yeah, that could have, be as far as what I've said. You see the focus here? Hopefully this is coming across what I, what I was trying to say before. They are focused on the, the geometric uh, aspects of it. Like they're talking about cutting it up. They're talking about, well, or maybe it's the fundamental constituents that it's made of that, that have consciousness. And there are some people who think that, right? But from my point of view, and again, I, I regard this as sort of the mainstream view, certainly in cognitive science and even to a lesser extent in, in philosophy of mind, it's the functional side of it that's critical. Now there's a connection between structure and function, but if you're just focused on these sort of uh, fairly... Uh, 
uh, sort of uh, simplistic concrete structural elements like shape and size and what it's made of, you're missing the functional side of it. So the question is, what are the functions of cognitive processes? And, how, and then you ask how they implement it. And then you can look at the structures that perform those. It's like it, 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 the, it's the mistake seems to be as if you looked at the brain and asked what type of atoms are there. Well, there's mostly carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, and that talking about the chemical identity of the atoms that make up the brain will somehow tell you about how the brain performs cognitive functions. Well, it, it won't, right? That that's the wrong that's the wrong form of analysis. It's not the things that it's made of as such. That will give you this answer or, or even you know if you just describe the structural aspects like the shape and size of the brain or whatever else um again that may be relevant in some respects but that's also the wrong level of analysis you need to be looking at a functional analysis this is by the way not some sort of special pleading for cognition although cognition is unique in some respects but this is how biological uh, biology is understood everywhere we, we always in, in biology study the function of a protein or a gene the function of an organ the function of a particular cell type or tissue type the function of even a, a population in an ecosystem in terms of their interaction with uh, uh, with other species. So, so we always apply this sort of functional analysis to understand what, what things do and how they relate to um, other uh, other systems in there or other things in, in the system that they interact with. Cognition is particularly important to study that way. So the point, the point here is if you try to study anything in biology, including cognition and the mind, in the, in the kind of way that, that they're doing here, you, you just won't get anywhere. You'll be like, well, we've got these uh, different bits of tissue that are made up of these elements, but like, how does it die? Like, where does digestion come from? You know, I, I can see all these atoms connected together in this hollow sac in the stomach and the, you know, in uh, the small intestine worming out from it, whatever. But like, where is the digestion from that? If I cut it up, do I get digestion? That Well, you're missing the point. You need to study it functionally and look at the functional components of digestion and the metabolism of different types of uh, of biomolecules and, and how that works at the cellular level and blah, 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 right? So functional analysis is needed here, not a crude structural analysis. If you only pursue a crude structural analysis, of course, you're going to think that you're never going to get consciousness or, or mental activity of any sort because you're, you're just looking at it in completely the wrong way. But that's the same as if you studied any complex biological uh, function in this way. Said so far, yeah, that's a live option. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to get a little deeper. I'm going to talk about these three different theories, and then we'll come back to that. Okay, that question. Okay. So one theory would be that um, the reason this is not thinking is because there are no thoughts anywhere in reality. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of eliminativist, uh, materialist view of reality, which is not like it's not a, a view that no one holds. People do hold. Right. There's view. a surprising number of philosophers. I've met some in person. Um, one whom I've not met in person, Alexander Rosenberg. I was reading his work recently, An Atheist Guide to Reality, and he talks about this problem of how something purely material could be about something else. And he, he thinks that clumps of matter can't be about other clumps of matter, but to have a thought means that something can be about something so that therefore there are no thoughts. So that would be one theory. That'd be one way of explaining why this thing is not thinking. It's because nothing's thinking. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the limit of this option. Uh, that's not the most popular option among the philosophers of mind, but there's a surprising number of philosophers who've entertained that. Um, Paul and Patricia Churchland, Daniel Dennett has a, a version of uh, eliminating at least the subjective or qualitative aspect of consciousness, that sort of subjective feeling. And um, so that, that's an option to think about. Okay, now, my reason against the limitivism is fundamentally that I think that we have a power, a special power, to witness our own thoughts. Okay, so there's an issue here that I, I want to raise. Um, now, it, it does sort of backtrack a bit, but I want to talk about the order of this here. So what he's doing is outlining three positions about consciousness. I, I think essentially they are eliminativist, uh, reductionist, and um, I'm not sure that there's a word for consciousness being fundamental. Uh, and... He's obviously arguing for the latter, that consciousness is in some sense fundamental. Well, actually, I don't know that consciousness is entirely the right word because he also talks about other aspects of, of uh, mental, like, like intention uh, of the mental, like intentionality, for instance, which is not the same as consciousness, although, of course, related. But anyway, uh, I, I, so I may be a bit loose when I say consciousness. I, I may not be very specific about what aspects of that I'm talking about because I don't think they're entirely clear either. But putting that aside, these three views about, um, uh, about consciousness slash the mind, where it's um, eliminativist, reductionist, or... Uh, it's fundamental. Um, and he's now just mentioned the first one, a luminativist, and then he's going to proceed to say what some of the problems with that are. Now, that's fine. The issue is, I think that when you're presenting a series of views like that, and sort of going through them and then arguing for the one that you prefer, it's uh, it's at least good to mention why people argue for a luminativism, at least in brief, like give at least some idea of the reasons why. And he does kind of do that later, right? Um, but I feel like the way he does it is not 
it's just not ideal for, if you're trying to present sort of present the views fairly. I'm not saying that Josh can't advocate for the view that he prefers, right? That's that's fine, right? But I just think it's odd to raise a view and then immediately criticize it without even giving a hint as to why anyone would accept it, especially because I, I think the implication here is not that you're supposed to already kind of know what the arguments for it are and we're just present. Like I, The idea is that you probably haven't even heard of that before, the way that it's raised here. So at least give us some idea of why people argue for it and then tell us why they're wrong. Don't just say why the view's wrong. I, I, I don't like that way of sort of proceeding philosophically I just sort of a, a knock them down approach rather than well here's the view here's the arguments for it but here's why i think it's you know that those arguments aren't compelling I, I, that's what i would you know i think that's a better way to do it essentially um okay so let's see what yeah so i've got a bit more to say about uh eliminativism but i want to play it a bit before we get to that so let's thoughts keep going. in our mm -hmm. mind this is a kind of introspective power have a thought in your mind focus on it think about your thought Think about it. Do you want me to? Do you want to me to do this right now, or are you just like kind of telling a? Well, anybody can do this. So anybody who's watching this, you can. And you actually have to do the work. You know, don't don't take my word for this. You have to do the work to pay attention focus to your consciousness. On focus on your thought. Notice its attributes. And there are. I list in my book on thoughts. Um, I've got a book on consciousness. I've got a chapter on thoughts. And in that chapter, I talk about five attributes of thought that you can discover through paying attention to a thought in your mind. Hmm. You don't discover this by looking at brains. You don't see any of these attributes from looking at brains. You discover them only by looking inwardly at a thought. And you can notice that a thought will have a feature of aboutness. For example, the thought that Cameron is cool is about you, it's about Cameron, okay? So there's an aboutness quality to a thought. Um, thoughts also have logical relations to other thoughts. So you can have the thought that Cameron is cool and Josh is cool. Now that's a complex thought that has an and link in there. Mm -hmm. We can replace the and with an or link. And and or are so familiar to us, but I mean like, what is and, what is or? I mean, th these are very special bits of reality and we access them through this introspective access to our own consciousness. Now, this may be over and else, but imagine saying that and and or are bits of reality. Like, what what kind of ontology do you have to have where you think that that's a bit of reality? I suppose if you're a Platonist and you think that there's some sort of platonic form that the word and and or correspond to. But I don't know that that really works with an idea that consciousness is fundamental and andness and orness are somehow uh, something that consciousness apprehends like through you can apprehend through introspection i don't know uh maybe there's some more oh, i assume there's more to be said there but that just that way to express it seems really strange to me what i would say is and and or are abstract well i gotta be careful you're not abstract entities but abstractions that we use to describe the relations between ideas and so they should be thought of as sort of mental constructs um I suppose you could say a mental construct is a bit of reality or piece of reality i think he said but i don't know i just think the language there is a little odd but you know, so that's the second aspect of thoughts are logically linked. There's also a structure to thoughts. So snow is white has a structure. It combines the concept of snow, concept of white, combines them into an organized structure. Then there's a truth value. Thoughts can be true or false. And I've got a whole book on, on truth. So that's a topic in its own right. You know, what is truth? But that's something that you find out through introspective analysis. This gets, gets underneath science. This gets underneath all theories. All theories of reality are, require this basic grasp of truth. Otherwise, you can't know if a theory is true or not. And then finally, this is another thing that irritates me that he just sort of drops in things like this. Now, he did mention that he's uh, written a whole book on truth, which I haven't, right? So I, I don't know what he has to say in that book. But, you know, the, the idea that the notion of truth gets gets behind all theories or something, otherwise you can't know what is true. I, I don't even understand that. Like, truth is actually an extremely difficult, slippery concept or uh, idea. Um, and there are plenty of people, plenty of philosophers, who don't even think we need the idea of truth, right? So-called so deflationary views, where basically... Just get rid of the notion of truth. Like you don't need to talk about it. You just talk about what is and what isn't. Like instead of saying, you know, it is true that you just say whatever you want to say. Uh, that that's very crude idea of deflation or idea of truth. So, um, I don't know exactly what Josh Rasmussen thinks about deflation ideas of truth. But the point I want to make here is that just throwing out things like, oh well, this idea gets 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 behind all. Sorry, gets underneath all theories and it's before all of science. I, I feel like that that's an extremely controversial and. Um, complex and um i don't there needs to be i need a word here for something that opens many cans of worms i'm not quite sure what the word is but, but there's so many issues there to unpack to just throw that out there i find i don't know unhelpful like just i don't know what, why say that and, and bringing this back to the point that we're addressing here what josh is doing here is he's articulating some aspects of uh, the mind aspects that he thinks you can uh, access or uh, come to know about through just introspection and so he mentioned intentionality, that's thoughts being about things. You know, so I think about a tree, I'm not just, I mean, there's a thought there, but uh, the idea is that the thought is, has some relation to th something outside of the thought, that, that the relation between 
the mental construct or the mental uh, activity and then the thing in the world so that's aboutness or intentionality uh so that's one of them and then he mentioned logical relations was another one and an or and he mentioned truth values um now there were a couple of others i can't remember what the others were one point i wanted to make there is that the at least those three things like truth values logical relations and intentionality none of those things are actually consciousness per se like subjective experience they may be related to it but they're, they're certainly not like strictly the same issue um intentionality is discussed separately likewise like the status of logic and, and truth are all discussed separately from the issue of like the hard problem of consciousness so so we do have to be a bit cautious here about specifically what issues we're trying to address and that's i think one overarching problem with this discussion is that there's a lack of clarity about well exactly what issue like what specific question are we trying to answer um, is it like where does is it what gives rise to subjective experience or why is there any subjective experience or is it how is intentionality grounded in the physical world or is it how are logical relations um represented in in the brain or or how do we refer to things using logical relations or uh what is truth and how does that relate to our mental representations you know th there's many things that it could be there's many questions that we could be uh, asking and, and they're not the same question like you, you need greater clarity to uh, really, I think, make, make progress in, in these philosophical discussions. So I, I think there's a lack of clarity at some points in this discussion. And, and that's, that's coming up here when, when we're just sort of putting out all of these different things, which are related, but, but very much not the same. And so it makes it hard for, for sort of me as a materialist to, uh, to, to give a cogent response when someone just says, well, what about all this stuff? And I'm sort of thinking, well, what, what about it, right? <laughs> what, what specifically are you asking? Uh, now, they do get a little more specific about the, the questions later on but I, I think that that is an issue about just the requirement for clarity about what the question is and what the issue that we're supposed to be uh, trying to resolve certainly there's a kind of um, what it's like to have a thought it's kind of subjective aspect to having a thought so these are features five features of thoughts that you can uh, discover and you don't discover them by looking at lego pieces or looking at brains you discover them by looking inwardly and this is the reason that i'm convinced that thoughts are real through this introspective power in fact more convinced that thoughts are real than that you aren't a green alien because right? I might be hallucinating, right? Maybe you are a green alien over there, right? And I just am imagining that you're not. Um, I think you're probably not, but I'm crystal clear certain that um, I've got some thoughts through mm -hmm. introspection. And so this is the way that we eliminate that first yeah, possibility. The first, the, well, so yeah, the first explanation. To for, try to bring it back to the, the yeah. Legos. So these, these Legos aren't thinking. One reason to explain that is that nothing's thinking. Um, I think that theory is too simple. It doesn't account for all the data. It doesn't account for my thoughts. So I don't think that works. The second idea is- Well, let's yeah. stay on that for just one second because I mean, it just seems so obvious. And, and that's kind of like what you were just getting at. Like, just think about your own thoughts. Think about the properties of those thoughts. Yeah. And so you're just telling someone to, to do some introspection. But like, how, so how does someone like Alex Rosenberg yeah. get to the conclusion that, you know, there are no thoughts? And Because I mean, he's coming to this conclusion, but if he doesn't exist, yeah. So how, how do they like avoid that? It just seems so obvious. I appreciate this question. And when I was in graduate school studying the philosophy of mind, I began reading these articles. Oops, sorry, clicked on the wrong tab and couldn't find the uh, couldn't find StreamYard. Um, yeah, so th this is what I was saying before about that this feels out of order. What you should explain, uh, even in a few sentences, what some of the motivations for the theory are before explaining why you, you don't agree with it. Not, here's why the theory is wrong, let's move on. And then you're called back to, well, why does anyone think that if it's so obviously crazy? And I appreciate that's a good question from Cameron, but I just, like Josh was about to move on. <laughs> he wasn't going to say anything about why anyone would uh, adhere to this view, which he says is just obviously crazy. And to a lot of people, sounds kind of nuts when you first say it. I actually have some sympathy with this view, Illuminativism, although I don't ultimately uh, agree with it. Although the, the reason I disagree with it isn't the same as the one that I think, uh, the reason why Josh and Cameron don't. But, but let's hear what they have to say about this. Articles um, talking about the problem of consciousness. There was an article by Peter Unger who talked about the problem of understanding how he could exist. Mm -hmm. Now, later in his career, he ends up arguing from his existence to the reality of consciousness that goes beyond the physical world. Um, but he was really thinking, how could, there, how could there be consciousness in a fundamentally physical world? Now, I don't want to overstate my own confidence here, even though I have to be honest and say that I am confident, but I, I don't want to overstate it. And well, that's important to do that, right? Because you want to be honest about how confident you are. I want to be honest about how confident I am, but I also want to be honest about how much respect I have for eliminativists really grappling with consciousness and mm -hmm. really trying to understand how there could be something else beyond the physical world that's fundamentally, it's something that we don't find in fundamental physics, mm -hmm. thoughts, aboutness, um, truth, value, logic. I actually missed that the first time I listened to this. So something that we don't find in fundamental physics. Now, this is an interesting statement, and this is a criticism that I have of what I regard as sort of mysterianism about, uh, well, consciousness, but also, uh, again, remember when I say consciousness, Josh is actually talking about many things that aren't the same as consciousness, like intentionality and uh, and logical re representation of logical relations and truth. Uh, but anyway, so so the, the, this notion that the, the mental is so mysterious. Now, there's certainly unusual things about it. Um, but the thing is, almost everything that we know about 
is not uh, does not exist at the level of fundamental physics. In fact, there's very little that exists at the level of fundamental physics. You know, we've got quarks and electrons and bosons and a few other things, but but th there's not really that much there. Almost everything else is made up out of those things and uh, complex interactions of those things. Uh, now, maybe there's other stuff as well. Maybe there's minds or gods or spirits or, or whatever, if you believe in those things. But at the very least, there's certainly many, many physical objects and processes and systems that are made up out of very complex interactions and, and aggregates of fundamental particles. So the question is, why is there so there's such a problem about combining these things to make minds if there isn't a comparable problem that combining these things that elemental particle fundamental particles to make other things so i mean people don't typically have a problem with the idea that planets say are just made up of fundamental particles planets are remarkably complex entities that have all sorts of properties that you don't see at the level of fundamental particles and of course there's different positions in philosophy about how all that works Meriology is the study of parts and holes that that's part of it uh, as well as reduction and supervenience and a bunch of these other fancy words so i'm not saying the answer is necessarily straightforward all i'm saying is what is different about the mental uh, such that the fact that mental properties aren't found at the level of fundamental physics is a problem but the fact that others properties and and um, entities are not found at the level of fundamental physics isn't a problem Many people will say that, say, subjectivity or intentionality are especially problematic. But I, I guess the question is, why are they so problematic that, that other properties or phenomena aren't? Um, what's what's unique about them such that we think that that can't be explained in terms of interactions and aggregates of, of fundamental pieces? Um, I, I think that's a fundamental objection from the reductionist point of view, that it's just sort of asserted that there's something unique about this case of reductionism compared to others. And I, I think that there's a bit of a, an impasse there because uh, many people who, like Josh, who think that this is a problem will simply say that it's obvious to them that you just can't. And, and we see this at the end when Josh basically says exactly this. It's just sort of so obvious that you can't reduce the mental to the physical. Uh, and these properties like intentionality or subjective experience and so forth just, just can't be reduced to uh, particles interacting in, in fields of force. Whereas the reductionist like me is sort of like, well, so many other things that are very different and not obvious reduced to those. So wh why why not the mind? It sort of seems a bit like it's just a special pleading almost. It's like, well, th this one thing just just can't. Um, so I, I think that that's actually a sort of a fundamental divide, honestly, in, in these views. It's some people just really hold to that intuition that these things can't. And other people like me are just just not convinced that, that that's a very good reason for thinking that they can't. Now, that's in addition to, I think, the significant progress we have made to, towards actually understanding how the reduction does work, uh, but we, there's still a long way to go there. And so um, th those are somewhat separate lines of argument. Yeah, so I, I think there are going to be people coming and going throughout the stream, and I, I can't constantly redefine my term. So I'll just, just say, sort of say one more time. So when I say intentionality, that refers to being a thought being about something. So when I think about a tree, that's not just a thought. There's also the idea that it has some sort of relation to something outside of the thought, that is the tree or a dog or whatever it whatever it be and that's called aboutness or intentionality is the uh, the strict word with respect to consciousness that term philosophically and scientifically is used in many different ways there's self-consciousness there's consciousness as uh, awareness um there's consciousness as sort of integrated um uh, uh, integration of, of different information or different systems. There's consciousness as a sort of a bare qualia, bare experience. And these are related to each other, but they're distinct aspects of, of mental function or, or mental experience. And so one has to be cautious about precisely which one of them one is talking about. Often when we're talking about the hard problem of consciousness, that refers to subjective qualia, subjective experience or raw feels, as it's sometimes called. Um, uh, but, but I want to emphasize again that solutions to one of these problems do not necessarily provide solutions to others. And so I, I um, recommend caution in the way these terms are used. All right. So that being said, let's keep going here. So remember, we're talking about eliminativism, and Josh is now explaining why some people are eliminativists. This, this is really, it's making me think about like, what is the fundamental nature of reality? Is it mental or is it physical? Yeah. Or, or I, I suppose like we were actually talking about this a little how bit too. How do you define like, physical? So how do you define physical? And it should it be like, should we even title this video? Like, are you pure, purely mental or purely non-mental? It might know. be a false dichotomy. But what, I, but what that made me think about is maybe he's so certain that there's non-mental reality, you know, and then, and then you grapple with this problem. And so that leads him to think that, you know, non-mental reality is the, the sort of fundamental thing and there's no mental reality. There's also emphasis. But then it's like going back to the, what we were just talking about, like your just introspect on your own thoughts. Yeah. It seems like that is like, you would be way more confident that you have thoughts than that there is this sort of non-physical realm. If you can trust. Non-mental realm. If you can trust introspection. 
So there's, there's a whole literature on the reliability of introspection. And um, kind of what happens here is there's an emphasis on scientific inquiry that emphasizes your empirical senses, like seeing, touching, um, tasting, you know, these, these senses. And there's a question about whether introspection is reliable or how reliable it is. There's also this question about how we can explain that sort of common folk talk about consciousness. This is sometimes called folk ontology. And what some philosophers have done is they've worked out another theory. It's a kind of error theory that explains why we're actually making a mistake when we talk about thoughts as real subjective realities. But then you're right, that means that we can't be relying on this sort of introspective access um, to our consciousness. And so that's kind of where the debate lies. Is can we justify the reliability of introspection? Our, our, but in order to do, it seems like you're kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. This is the argument I ended up making in my book, is that you actually need to use introspection in order to, to even evaluate. know that you're making observations yeah. in a scientific inquiry. Because that depends on a kind of introspective access to the sense of your own senses, mm -hmm. the sense that you're actually seeing something. You know, you sort of There's something very problematic about yeah. using your your introspection to rule out your own introspection. Yeah. Some, you know, I'm, That's I'm, right. yeah, yeah. I'm making it oversimplified, but yeah, no. It's, so there's deep problems. So ultimately, I do think it's self defeating. Okay, um, but well, there's a whole yeah. discussion on that. Yeah, and um, lest we spend too much time on, you know, because we could each one of these different. I'm we thinking of like diving deeper. And I'm thinking deeper of a tree. I'm thinking of an of an analogy, and it helps me to when I do interviews to like think about all of the different things that are being discussed in an interview. So we start with like the trunk of the tree, is yeah. where, and then I'm looking at the roots because the, the roots are going down deep into what's like sort of holding the tree up. Yep. So we, we went down these different like paths of explaining why these building blocks are not mental. And then we started looking at, you know, interest. Sorry, I probably should have paused a little earlier. I just wasn't sure if they'd moved on yet. So um, let's talk a little bit about a little bit about eliminativism. I think that the um, the arguments given there are not, not very satisfactory, although it was good that to hear Josh bring up the issue of the reliability of introspection, because that is at uh, th that is at the um, core of the eliminativist arguments about uh, why we should be very suspicious of uh, these sort of introspective arguments, because they essentially don't think that that form of introspection is reliable. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, there's a good um, Stanford Encyclopedia article on eliminative materialism. Um, actually, maybe I'll just show that. Uh, can I? I think that's a new. Oh, yeah, nice. It's a new option. I can just jump to sharing that tab. Uh, here we go. So this is eliminative materialism. Uh, there's some good. Uh, there's some good points here. I was just trying to find the part that I wanted to talk about. I think it might have been here. Yeah, here we go. So. Um, I'll put a bit of text there. You can see the Churchlands have been quite active. Paul and Patricia Churchland have been quite active in, in making these sorts of arguments. Um, the basic case, as I understand it, is something like this. When people are introspecting the way that Josh was talking about and making these claims about uh, about the mind or their own minds, uh, when I say these claims, I mean claims like that they are thinking, that they have intentionality uh, about logical relations, about truth, um, and all of these sorts of things that they say. Um, what they are doing is that they are appealing, they, they are not just making theory uh, neutral statements. Actually, th that's why I was sort of annoyed that Josh said that they're theory neutral because they're not, right? <laughs> well, at least I, I, I think that's implausible that they're not. Um, uh, this, this sort of borrows from an idea from philosophy of science called the theory dependence of observation. Whenever you make an observation, there's a theory lateness to that, that you, we always use theory to interpret data. And so our, our, our observations are made through the lens of the theory. And the theory... Uh, so the eliminative essay that we use in interpreting our introspective evidence is uh, sometimes called folk psychology. So you'll see that mentioned here. Um, and the idea is that folk psychology consists of some sort of common sense psychology and uh, views of, uh, and just sort of intuitive views we have about minds and how they work. And so we, we carry with us a set of language and assumptions about minds and other people's minds and language and, and, um, uh, and, and thoughts and beliefs and things like that. And the idea is that folk psychology, actually it says that here, folk physics, folk biology, folk uh, epidemiology, and the like all prove to be radically mistaken. Since folk theories generally turn out to be mistaken, it seems quite improbable that folk psychology will turn out to be true. Indeed, since folk psychology concerns a subject that is far more complex and difficult than any past folk theory, it seems wildly implausible that this one time we actually got things right. Uh, end quote there from, from the article. And so... Uh, I, that's a sort of a theoretical uh, justification for being skeptical about folk psychology. I think that there are empirical reasons to be very skeptical about it as well, uh, that we are very poor at introspecting and citing reasons for why we are acting, for example. Um, I did a podcast uh, episode years ago on the introspection illusion. That is when you ask people, why are they doing things? Um, often they give answers which demonstrably are not the real reasons they're doing it, at least when you can control for that. Um, very interesting research there. I won't really get into that now. I, I 
you know, that would take too long, but, and I'd have to look up the references. But the point is that there are both, I think, good empirical reasons and good theoretical, like philosophical type reasons for being very suspicious of the reliability of this sort of introspection. So again, just to clarify the argument there, the argument, the theoretical argument goes, introspection is theory dependent. That theory that it appeals to is folk psychology. Folk psychology, like other folk theories, is highly unreliable. And therefore, the conclusions of folk psychology, uh, introspection based on folk psychology, should not be trusted. That It doesn't follow from that that all folk psychology is wrong. Like there might be some parts of it that can be salvaged. Um, but it means we should be highly suspicious and not take those intuitive judgments as, uh, well, we, we should take them with many grains of salt. And we shouldn't certainly take them as the way that Josh was saying, so the things we can be absolutely most confident about. Um, and I think that this is this is sort of a hard thing for people to understand because you're saying because it seems like what well, were you saying that I'm not thinking or or that I don't have a mind or, or like what, what are you saying? And the idea would be not exactly. I mean, sort of right, but but more precisely, it would be to say that the 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 whole con the set of concepts that we have about minds and language and intentionality and whatever else may be fundamentally confused and full of tensions and contradictions. Uh, that we don't normally think about or see, but can be drawn out through philosophical and scientific investigation. Um, and y y there's more discussion of some of the details in, in this article. I'm not going to try to get into those here. But the idea is, if we try to work all these out, what we'll end up with is a theory that looks very different from folk psychology. Just as folk physics is full of um, uh, full of incorrect ideas, like the idea that um, um, objects uh, curve w when they're being um, swirled around, like they continue to curve after the, the uh, when there's no forces uh, applied to them, or that the, the natural position of objects is to fall towards the, cent the center of the earth, or that um, that heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones. Like that, these are aspects of folk physics that students of, of physics have to unlearn as they uh, you know proceed through their curriculum. Likewise, there are views in folk biology, folk epidemiology, um, folk economics, even that there's all sorts of views that we have that we get from upbringing a culture and evolution, maybe who knows where they come from, uh, many of which are wrong, some of which are right, but many of which are wrong, and some of which are maybe sort of misleading at best. Uh, and the idea is, likewise, that's true for folk psychology. And indeed, it may be systematically true for so many aspects of folk psychology that these introspections, which are uh, laden with this folk psychological theorizing, really just should not be trusted. That's the basic underpinning of eliminative materialism. And so, of course, it requires a bit of a further argument to say, well, then we actually should then reject the idea that there are such things as minds. That that would be a quite a strong view. And I personally wouldn't go that far. I would say that folk psychology needs to be fundamentally um, reassessed and, and uh, reconstructed, essentially, to a scientific psychology. And so a lot of our folk concepts about maybe beliefs and intentions and so forth will likely need to be reassessed. But I think that we can probably salvage a fair bit of it. Um, I don't think that we're going to have to throw out everything like the eliminativists think. And that's, I think, where you see a difference between maybe the reductionists, which is what I would call myself, and, and the eliminativists. The eliminativists think that folk psychology is sort of so rotten to the core that we have to throw out basically the whole lot, including a whole bunch of intuitive language about minds uh, and, and thoughts and so forth. Whereas the reductionists like me think that, yes, there's going to be a lot of reconstruction that will need to be done, but we can salvage many of these core concepts. Uh, that's the sort of the fundamental difference here. I just want to see... If there's anything else I wanted to illustrate here, maybe this quote will be helpful as well. So let me quote from this. A uh, quote, eliminativists like the Churchlands warn that we should be deeply suspicious about the reliability of introspective evidence about the inner workings of the mind. If inner observation is as theory laden as many now suppose outer perception to be, what we introspect will largely be determined by our folk psychological framework. In other words, introspecting beliefs may be just like people seeing demonic spirits or celestial spheres. This skepticism about the reliability of introspection is bolstered by empirical work that calls into question the reliability of introspection. As we will see in the next section, the idea that introspection offers an illusory image of the mind is gaining popularity not just with regard to information bearing states like belief, but also with regard to phenomenal states like qualia, end quote. So that, that's actually a really useful quote there because it emphasizes a number of points that I wanted to bring up. One is that this idea that uh, introspection is theory laden, and that theory is folk psychology, and folk psychology should not be relied upon is the argument. And there are both theoretical and empirical reasons, like scientific reasons for thinking that uh, folk psychology is not reliable. So that's one of the key points there. Another key point here is that um, this notion of theory ladenness applies to other things as well. Um, so, so, and I think I really like the example here, right? Because you, you will talk to people who have experience or who report experiences of demonic possession or miraculous healings or God's love or, um, uh, God's um, communication to them or, or all sorts of things like that, right, um, in different religious traditions. And the thing is, what they don't give you is a 
very sort of stark, minimal, objective third person account of precisely what um, uh, what perceptions they had at, at different times. I mean, we don't even store memories like that. So it's unclear how they could do that, right? What they do is they tell you something that is theory laden. They say, I saw a person who had a demon, uh, was possessed by a demon and then was exercised, or, or I saw someone who was healed, or I felt the Holy Spirit within me. Those are theory laden, right? Because they are, imb they are not just pure observational reports. They are embedded within the theory that the person believes, their, their framework for interpreting things. So the, the, the framework and the observations are tied up together and, and can't be separated. Um, well, whether you think they can be separated in principle is, is another issue. But the point is that in practice that they essentially never are. Um, so this is true, not just for, for things like demonic spirits. It's true for pretty much everything that, that we do, right? You know, so when I go outside and I say, oh, I saw a tree or I saw a car, that's theory lane, right? Because I'm, I'm using my theory about what is a tree and what makes up a tree. I, I don't tell you the precise uh, combination of, of sensory impressions that I had. I just report the, the theory laden statement, uh, belief that I, that I formed on the basis of, of those perceptions. So the point is that uh, this notion of theory lendness is a, is a much broader issue. It's not just relevant to introspection, but the idea is it, it, just as insofar as it's relevant to at what they call outer perception here, like sight and sound and whatever else, it's, it's also relevant to introspection. When you introspect, uh, your the results of that, the beliefs you form from it, are also highly theory laden. And so I think that this provides us with a bit of a, a model for thinking about how we could be mistaken, even about such fundamental things as that we have minds, right? The idea would be, well, you could be mistaken about that just as someone could be mistaken about the fact that they're possessed by a demon or that God spoke to them. You'd think, well, surely you would know that, right? Like, how could you be mistaken about something like that? Well, you could be mistaken about it because your whole structure for viewing things and interpreting your experience could be fundamentally flawed. And so, yeah, sure, that there must be something going on that explains the experiences that you form, but it could be fundamentally and and qualitatively different from uh, the what the beliefs that you formed about it, if the theory that you're using to interpret it is fundamentally wrong and and confused. That's the basic idea of illuminativism, as I as I understand it here, and as we sort of see from these quotes. Um, also, one last point: notice at the end here that it mentioned different aspects of. Um, well, the mind, I suppose. So they mentioned information bearing states like beliefs as well as phenomenal states like qualia. This is just a little illustration here of the importance of distinguishing what we're talking about. So information bearing states like beliefs, that's more related to intentionality um, and maybe truth that, that uh, Josh mentioned. But then there's phenomenal states like qualia and phenomenal relates to it having a feeling associated with it, right? And again, but both could be described as aspects of consciousness because you could be conscious of beliefs and uh, you can be conscious of qualia, right? But uh, th there's many there's many aspects here and they need to be sort of teased apart. So that's just another way of sort of emphasizing the importance of, of um, keeping, you know, keeping a clarity on what we're talking about. Uh, okay. So jumping back to, to the video, um, let's just summarize here. So um, Josh is saying that there are three ways of understanding the relationship between the mind and the mind and material, let's say. And the first he's mentioned is eliminativism. He first said why eliminativism is bad, basically because it, or in, incorrect because it contradicts his introspective evidence. Um, and then Cameron pulled him up and said, well, but why does anyone believe it if it's so obviously wrong? And Joss kind of briefly mentioned this idea about the reliability of introspection, but we didn't really get too much on that. And then I've tried to give a bit more background and try to uh, be a bit fairer to the eliminativists, even though, again, I'm not one. I do have some sympathies there. Um, the basic the basic issue being that question about the reliability of that form of introspection is absolutely critical here. And if, as the eliminativists say, um, introspections like that are doused in folk theory, folk psychology, uh, and, and um, folk psychology like that is unreliable, then therefore those introspections uh, are also should be regarded as unreliable. And that we need to use other methods to assess how the mind works and what its structure and properties are than just relying on introspective access. Introspective access, uh, introspective evidence and folk beliefs have, got, have led us astray many, many times, even for things that people thought were extremely obvious and intuitive. So we should be highly cautious there. And I, I, I'd be broadly sympathetic with that approach, although I would say that I think that we can still salvage many concepts from folk psychology, such as belief and mind and so forth. But we will need to reconstruct them using a scientific approach, um, not a intuitive, introspective approach. That doesn't mean that introspection is totally useless, by the way. That doesn't follow. It doesn't mean that it's always wrong, uh, but it means that it suffers these major limitations. Now, there's one final point that I wanted to mention that was that Josh brought up at the end there, that there's some sort of self-defeating aspect of eliminativism because it basically uses 
it, it rejects introspection, but then in order to appeal to, say, empirical evidence, what well, you have to use introspection to get anything from the senses, right? Now, there's a part that this, there's a part to this argument that is, uh, that is correct, right? And, and we sort of just saw that in the quote, because this problem of theory, um, theory lateness of observation is a problem for internal sort of evidence like introspection and external evidence like sight and sound. So there is an issue there, right? There are epistemological problems that need to be dealt with. So I certainly agree with that aspect of it. But there's a false equivalence here, it seems to me, because it, it just doesn't follow that because introspection about the nature of the mind is highly unreliable, that, that appeals to folk psychology and so forth, that therefore any type of appeal to subjective evidence is also equally unreliable, even when that subjective evidence and by subjective evidence here, what I mean is something like, you know, I read a paper or I saw a graph, like anything that comes through the senses, right? So, so that's maybe I should say empirical evidence. There. It, it doesn't follow that any sort of empirical evidence uh, that is interpreted through a theoretical framework is equally unreliable, right? Because they're, they're, they're different methods, uh, they're different like senses and they're different theories that are being used to interpret them, right? So if I use my vision and my hearing to access information about scientific reports and papers and so forth, and then I integrate that within a framework of scientific methodology, uh, best practice science, uh, maybe some philosophy as well to help me think through things, logic, um, statistics, um, and our scientific worldview and knowledge. If that's the way I approach things, it's just not the case that that's going to be as equally problematic as introspecting about the structure of the mind using folk psychology as a theoretical framework. The fact that both of those things do rely on subjective processes to some extent, like they're, they're, I'm using my mind, I'm using my senses in some way, um, it doesn't mean that they're both as equally unreliable. That, that That's just a foolish, th uh, that would be a foolish thing to argue, right? That Because there are some things in common between them, that therefore they're both equally suspect. And, and I hear this sort of argument made in other contexts as well, and I, I do not understand how people find that like persuasive. Uh, again, but it's... It, it, Basically, to, to make to make it to sort of simplify a bit, it's basically saying that because there are different cognitive faculties and one cognitive faculty, like introspection about the structure of the mind, is unreliable, therefore all other cognitive faculties that use the mind must also be equally unreliable and therefore you can't appeal to them. But that just doesn't follow. Some cognitive faculties, interpreted here quite you know broadly as, as things that we can do with the mind and the senses, some are more reliable than others and it really does depend on how you use it and the theoretical structure that you're using to interpret your your experiences and that's why science is so important it provides a theoretical structure a way of looking at things a methodology that allows us to avoid or at least reduce the risk of many of the errors that we're we're susceptible to when we rely on introspection and intuitive judgments it provides a constraint and a check on intuitive folk theories and and a way of testing them against empirical reality and of rigorously uh, formalizing our ideas um and ensuring that they're integrated in a whole and uh, in a whole that sort of fits together and so forth right so so that's the importance of a broadly scientific worldview and a scientific outlook um and so i i just don't buy this this equivalence between, well, because there are some things that are unreliable using the mind that therefore you can't appeal to anything and therefore science is off limits and therefore you can't have your limitivist. Well, no, they're not the same, right? <laughs> it all comes down to what is the theoretical approach that you're using to interpret and integrate your observations, um, be those internal observations or external ones. And, and I think that that's, uh, that's at the heart of it. And, and the idea is, well, folk psychology is, is a crappy one and we have better ones. So let's not use that one. That, that's the fundamental objection, I think. So just saying that, well, you're using your mind as well. I, I just, I think that's a really bad argument anyway. So I think that that's probably enough on eliminativism because there are other things that I want to talk about. Uh, so let's move on. And I think the next thing they're going to be talking about is reductionism here. Inspection and your thoughts and yeah. sort of ruling out eliminativism. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's right. And so we're, we're going down all these different paths and we could discuss each one of those more and look at more and more roots, but we probably need to get back to yes. and, uh, so, discussing and this the is good to go deep enough so that we can point to the complexity. This is not an easy topic. Yeah, and, and it's one of the reasons why I've, I've stayed away from it is because I feel like it's so... It's In my book, I use the metaphor of a cave of consciousness. It's a cave. And we go in with lights of introspection and reason and science. And it takes a lot of careful work. I mean, it's not just sort of immediate that you recognize, oh, there's five aspects of thoughts, mm -hmm. at least those five. Yeah. And then each of those aspects can be further analyzed. There's aspects of the aspects, you know, and it takes work. It takes work to actually do, to think about your thoughts and to identify those aspects. So what are these three, because we, we've only discussed one of them. Yeah, so we got so the, we eliminate everything. So limitivism, there are no thoughts. Another one would be a kind of reductionism where what it is to be a thought just is to have this shape or some other shape or some color or some molecular structure. So we, we reduce- Or to be made of some kind of- To material. be composed of some geometric structure. Um, so a kind of reductionist account. Um, and then the third one would be that there's something about consciousness that's not reducible to material things. So it's kind of, you might call it irreducible conscious aspects. Mm -hmm. So those would be- And the there three. are physicalist theories of the irreducible 
There are, yeah, so there's a wide range of theories that might account for how to say that they're irreducible. Um, my project has been to show that the first two theories, limitivism and reduction, have severe problems. Okay. So you have to go to a kind of irreducible consciousness. Okay, let's get to that yeah. in just a second, but I want to ask just kind of like an empirical question about the number of people that hold these views. Yeah. By the way, I want to comment on that little, uh, well, it's not exactly a syllogism, but it's almost one. So what Josh just said is that the first two views, eliminativism and reductionism, both have significant problems. Therefore, we need, therefore he said, we need to go for some sort of um, irreducible consciousness or irreducible mentality or something. Um, so again, I don't want to overinterpret here because he didn't present that as a formal argument, but he, he, he says similar things throughout the presentation. So it does seem to be the basic uh, thrust of his, of his reasoning here. And my problem is that that's a fundamentally wrong way of, of approaching things. Unless by serious problems, you mean that you have a sort of a deductive disproof of those theories, which I don't think he claims to have. Well, okay. So he does say at the end that he thinks it's sort of logically, does he say logically impossible? I don't know that he says logically impossible. I think he just says this is impossible. We'll, we'll have to check that language there. But unless you think that you actually do have a deductive disproof of eliminativism and reductionism, uh, in which case, well, then you can make that inference that it's got to be something else. But unless you have that, then it, it doesn't really matter how many problems eliminativism and reductionism have. What matters is how many problems do they have relative to their virtues in comparison to alternative views, particularly um, the idea that consciousness is is fundamental. So the point is, if we're in the business of evaluating comparative virtues of, of different theories, then it needs to be a comparative approach. It's not enough to say that some views have a bunch of problems if the other view has even more problems and, and, less, and less virtues. So I, I think that's a fundamental issue here with how the whole discussion appears to be framed in, in terms of, well, if we can just present enough problems for the other views, then uh, somehow the other one, the uh, consciousness as fundamental kind of wins by default. Well, well no, it doesn't work like that. Uh, again, unless you have a deductive disproof, um, which maybe Josh thinks he has again, but I, that to me doesn't come across, at least in this discussion, uh, then, then you're in the business of evaluating, uh, then you should be in the business of evaluating the theories against each other. And so again, it doesn't matter how many bad points there are against one theory. You've got to compare that to how many uh, pros and cons there are of the competing theory. And my argument would be that even if we think that, even if we kind of agree with many of the criticisms of, say, eliminativism or reductionism, I, I would argue that the idea that consciousness is fundamental is even worse as a theory, um, has many of the same problems and, and additional ones, and, and doesn't provide any greater explanatory insight for, from my point of view, at least in, in most areas. Um, I, I won't push that too far today because that's a little bit beyond what's discussed here, but I, I just think that that's an important piece of background to, to be thinking about. Like, okay, j just because this theory is bad, does that mean that this other one is better? Yeah. What would you say like the percentages that are eliminativists? I'm, I'm always gonna pronounce it, say that wrong. Yeah, so in Phil surveys, they did, they did a, um, I don't think it was fine-grained enough to look at eliminativism. I don't quite remember, I'd have to check. Okay. Um, but my impression, just from being in the field, going to conferences, talking to philosophers, reading the, the literature, is that eliminativism is not, is not a main physicalist view, but there's a surprising number of eliminativists. Okay. Um, reductionism is also one that is, it still is sort of on the rocks. Minority? It's sort of on the rocks, I would say. Okay. Um, there are some reductionists, but it, it looks to me that the kind of general trend in the field over the last 50 to 70 years is toward understanding consciousness as real, and irreducible to uh, material aspects, third yeah. person material aspects. And let me just say this, I wasn't trying to like build an argument from you know consensus yeah. or anything. I was just kind of curious, like what is the landscape of the, you know. In Which you probably don't want to do as Christian philosophers or apologists, because one of the most widely agreed upon philosophical theses, at least in the analytic world, is atheism. Academy. academy yeah, no, and it's so fascinating because there is a kind of dominant physicalist uh -huh. uh, view. Uh -huh. And you have physicalists in one camp arguing against physicalists in another camp. And so they're throwing bombs against each other's positions. And I'm sort of standing outside of that framework, right. finding it very fascinating to see the problems with eliminativism, the problems with reductionism, the problems also with deriving. If you have a kind of non-reductive physicalism and you derive consciousness from shape, you know, I mean, th think about this. I, I, for me, when I think about the Legos, it like helps me to really get clear on what's at stake. So like, think about this Lego and think about a thought about snakes, mm -hmm. all right? Now, I, I don't think there's any chance that this Lego is thinking about snakes. Yeah. I don't even think there's a slim probability of that, all right? You think it's zero? I, I think it's zero because I think, well, unless this Lego is different than what I think it is. If this Lego is fundamentally a mental being mm -hmm. and that this shape is just a manifestation of some deeper mental substance, then maybe it is thinking. Well, see, I haven't even considered- But if it's fundamentally just merely material, then I think it's not even possible. It, what I'm thinking about is uh, panpsychism. Yeah, so, it, it could be that, you know, Thomas Nagel has got this theory that everything, even like atoms, have some kind of level of consciousness. Yeah, so there's a kind of panpsychist view that every that there's consciousness at every level of reality. Yeah. And there's, again, different ways of, of unpacking that. But even on that view, I think the best version of that view is going to have some kind of substance that's conscious or mental or spiritual or something like that. It's not going to be itself built fundamentally out of 
uh, mindless units of reality. If we think of this as fundamentally built out of mindless units of reality, it is sort of as it looks. It's got shape, it's got color. Then you can ask, okay, well, is it thinking in virtue of its shape? And you can get very specific. I think it's helpful to get specific. Think about this rectangular shape. You know, I can just, sorry, I, I can yeah. just imagine someone watching this and being like, why are we even asking if this Lego has thoughts? Well, because, okay, look, look, Cameron, Cameron. <laughs> it's just so if obvious clear, that it doesn't. If we, if we can get clear about this, because then you can start applying irrelevant differences. So you mm -hmm. can say it's, it's rectangular shape is not the right kind of shape to mm -hmm. make it think about snakes. Well, changing it to a square, changing its color, that's not a relevant difference. That's not going to make the difference. Yeah. You, you relocate it, put it in a brain, mm -hmm. you make it more complex. When I was in college, I thought, well, it's just a matter of complexity. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it, making a very complex... Like if you just had, if you just had a ton of Legos. No matter them how look, many look Legos like you put together, you will never generate a thought. All right, so this is the sort of... Uh, so remember I was talking before about the, the, the highly structural focus? They talk about the size of the Legos and how they're arranged together and the color and all of these sorts of things. Um, and I argued, and I would argue again, this is the wrong way to think about uh, things like the mind and consciousness, because right? they are really defined. They are construed in a functional way. They do particular things. It's not about the things that make them up. This is how we understand really everything in biology. Uh, we understand it through the function that it performs. Obviously, the structure structure determines function, so we need structure. But you don't just study the structure and then wonder how on earth, where does all of the function come from? Well, you need to study the function as well. This is about levels of analysis and understanding the way that uh, function is um, instantiated in in different different units. So I just I find this to be oh, I don't want to be too <laughs> too rude, but I just find this a really strange way to to think about consciousness. Maybe this is just because I'm a, more of a scientist and less of a philosopher, right? But this idea about oh, just maybe if it was just more Legos and it was more complex. But no, it's not the complexity. It's just something else. Like, what are you even talking about? Can, can we be specific about what the question is, and then let's talk about what we know scientifically and and think about different theories, right? I, I, I'm not saying that do away with all the philosophy. That's not the argument I'm making here, but it's just, uh, I'm asking for a bit more structure, a bit more clarity and try to relate this if we're actually interested in the brain, right? Let's try to relate it to the brain. Do we think that the brain has something to do with producing mental activity? Uh, Josh thinks that it does. We'll see that a little bit later. So the question is, well, what does it have to do with it? Um, what parts of mental activity or mental phenomena is the brain causally responsible for and which parts of it isn't? Or, or, or is it responsible for all of it, but there's something else in addition to it? Or, you know, you know, there, there are different views here, of course, right? But like, we need to break things down a bit and, and we need to ask the question, why is it that there are certain mental properties that we think cannot be reduced to um, the functional relations and uh, complicated interplay of more fundamental units? This is true for all sorts of highly complex systems that at least sort of pre-theoretically intuitively, you wouldn't think would be so reducible. So imagine a hurricane. Like if, if you were to tell someone, say a pre-scientific person, this hurricane here is entirely the product of tiny bits of oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen, a couple of other atoms bumping around uh, in, in, in particular ways. Uh, obviously that, that's a little bit of a oversimplification, but of course that, that's kind of what they're doing here with their, their, uh, their bricks. So I'm allowed to do that as well, right? If you were to tell this person that, they'd be saying, no, you, that's ridiculous. Like, it doesn't matter how complicated and how how you bounce these these uh, little little bits of nitrogen and oxygen around each other. They're not going to produce a hurricane, right? A hurricane has all this structure and, and, and you know it has this pattern to it and it does all this particular thing. That doesn't make sense, right? Intuitively, it's ridiculous to say that. If you don't come through, uh, have some sort of basic scientific understanding about you know the atmosphere and pressure and, and energy flows and so forth. And that's just one example. Um, Likewise, we could say this about all sorts of other biological systems, like a cell, where some people do say about the cell. In the past, people used to say, look, you can't get life out of just uh, oxygens and hydrogens and, um, uh, well, mostly it's carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens uh, joined together in complicated ways. It doesn't matter how complicated you make the bonds and, and how complicated you make the webs of interactions, you're just going to get life. Well, but I mean, do we still think that? Do we still think that life is not entirely reducible to biochemical interactions? We have literally, sorry to do this, but, but like science actually tells us how this happens, like how biochemical interactions give rise to life. Um, I'm not saying that we know every aspect to it, but we have a very good understanding of how that reduction happens. Um, and therefore, I, I just don't see the force of this argument that there are some properties that are just too out there, too mysterious, too different to be reduced to uh fundamental more fundamental units interacting in, in certain ways particularly when we understand when we study them appropriately through a functional lens not just the building block lens which again i, I don't think is a good way to think about it. this is the, the most crude uh, naive form of reductionism which is just like 
forget about all the high level structure. Just ask, what is it made of? And ask, can that thing have the right property? Like, well, it's just made of carbon and hydrogen. Can carbon and hydrogen breathe and walk around? No. So therefore, clearly, there must be something else to uh, a biological cell that, that's more than carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, or whatever. Th th that is not how science performs reduction. The idea is that you look at different levels in, in accordance with the functional relations that they have to each other. Like, what is a hurricane? What does it do? What properties does it have? How does that relate to the properties of air parcels and fluid flow and the Coriolis effect of the atmosphere and the um, the, the different like Hadley cells uh, of um, energy flow and um, uh, pressure around the, the different regions of the atmosphere? And how does that relate to the um, airflow, uh, the, the rising airflow uh, uh, of um, heated air at the, at the tropics? And how does that then uh, give rise to high and low pressure zones? And all of this stuff, right, it fits together. And then you can zoom in at the level of the individual air molecules and look at how those interact and their thermodynamic properties, right? It's about levels of analysis. It's about studying the appropriate properties at the appropriate level. That's exactly how we study things in biology. You look at things at the organismal level. You look at things at the systems level, the organ level, the tissue level, the cellular level, the, the protein level. And then the atomic level, the subatomic level, if you really want to, or like the quantum level, um, each has its own level of analysis to understand the functional relations and properties and so forth at that level. So to, to, to talk about, well, how do you get the mind out of a bunch of atoms or even a bunch of neurons? It's yeah, you're not going to right? you, you not, not in that way, not in the way that they're so, sort of seem to be conceptualizing it. You need to break it down more fine tuning. And this is what cognitive science does. Like this is what cognitive neuroscience does, right? This is. I mean, this is sort of what I do, right? I'm not saying we're all the way there yet, but but there's there's so much more to it than just oh, gee. So I mean, you make it more complicated, but that you know, the more Legos you have, it just it's, it still can't can't happen. Like, what's the actual argument? What are the properties that cannot be instantiated through a reductive interaction of co of complicated components, and why not? You may say, well, we don't know how that how that happens. Like, not not sufficiently yet. We haven't got that account, like we do maybe in the biochemistry case. To which I will say, no, we don't. Depending on what you're talking about, I think some areas we actually do have a good idea, but but others we don't. Right? It, it's still an open question. It's still subject to research. But then we have to ask the question: Well, the fact that we don't currently have that reductive account fully developed, does that mean that we should think that there can't be one? I don't think that's a very good inference to make, especially when you induct over past historical inferences of this sort. And I would argue always they failed. Like there are no other examples of, of like uh, high level complex irreducible phenomena, uh, I would argue, even though there are different views about reduction exactly. The idea that, well, cyclones are just irreducible. Like they can't be explained in terms of the, the components or the processes that make them up or like the economy is just irreducible. Like it can't be reduced to any further interactions and, and um, institutions and, and transactions and so forth. Or, uh, or digestive system is just irreducible. Like di digestion can't be reduced or, or metabolism um, or, or language is just irreducible. Well, Maybe that one you still have a but no, sorry. There, there are people who say sort of things about the irreducibility of uh, symbol meaning, but you, there's no one who argues that language is irreducible. So the point I'm making is that this argument doesn't really seem to apply anywhere else except when it it, it comes to the mind and and mental phenomena. Um, so in terms of inducting of a past experience, it seems a bad argument. In terms of um, simply the motivation for it, to me it seems undermotivated because it's just like, well, this is mysterious, and we we don't currently have that reduction. So therefore, there can't be one. I, I just, I don't see where that, how you connect those dots. Um, at most, that would lead you to some sort of agnosticism. About, well, we, we haven't figured it out yet. So we'll just sort of uh, see if we can figure it out. To say that something is irreducible to me is just basically a way of saying that we can't say anything more about it. Um, so how is that a good account? It, it's based, it's, it to me seems like the abdication of, of giving an account. Well, it's irreducible. It just has those properties because that's the properties that it has. End of story. There are further issues there because you, you get issues of the interaction problem and so forth, but we'll talk about this later. So I think there are further objections to, to the irreducibility argument. But the point is that I just find it undermotivated. The, the idea that there are higher order properties that um, that are not sort of obviously or straightforwardly can be understood in terms of the interaction of smaller components is entirely familiar, I would say, throughout all other human inquiry. So the fact that it also applies to the mind to me is not a great mystery or really anything... Uh, that should drive us to any particular philosophical conclusion other than that, well, we need to do more work on this. Um, now, there are people who have attempted to establish specifically why you can't have this or that, like intentionality or subjective quality or whatever, um, from material building blocks. Um, I, I think Josh says that he's kind of leans towards those arguments, but I don't know that he really presents them here. Uh, so again, the, the, the ambition here is not to cover everything. I'm, I'm covering this video. But I, what I would say, certainly in this video and also more broadly, I, I just haven't been convinced by, by the reasons offered as to why we should think that this reduction can't happen. Um, 
it just really does seem to be an argument from incredulity that we just, because we don't currently have it, and certain people through their introspection just can't imagine how it could be, that therefore it can't be. And I just regard that as a really weak source argument. And I think you can see this, not just empirically. I think that there is good scientific evidence for this, but also I think you can see this by reason itself. I think I've asked this in another interview we've done. Is this kind of like the Chinese room experiment? Similar to that. Similar to that. And that in there, you, you have, explain that real quick. Yeah, so in the Chinese room experiment, you have some, some guy in a, in a room. And this guy does not speak Chinese, but he's got this book of all the rules, of uh, syntactical rules of, of um, you know, if somebody says this, here's something you can say in response. Mm -hmm. So somebody who does speak Chinese sends a message into like a slit into the room. And this guy receives the message and he um, has no idea what he's reading, but he looks up in the book, um, finds the right formula. A, a, a formula for response. And then he pulls out a piece of paper, copies, you know, the response, sticks it out the slip. And then the guy reads it. Now the book is functioning, the, the whole room is functioning as if it understands Chinese. This is John Searle, and he's beating up against functionalist accounts of consciousness. He's saying that function is not enough to account syntax. Acting as if you understand something is not the same as actually consciously, from the first person perspective, having the sense, oh, I understand Chinese, mm -hmm. right? But it is functioning as if it understands Chinese. So the problem there is if function were enough, then you'd have to say that that room does literally understand Chinese. And but that, that seems absurd. It doesn't seem like the room is literally understanding Chinese. At least from that first person perspective, it seems like there's something more to understanding. We know what it is to understand. We have the experience of understanding. And by that experience, I think we can see that function is not enough. Okay, so we have the Chinese room argument now. Um, so I think that there's, this argument is very interesting, uh, and I won't do it justice here, but there are some points to be made. First of all, John Searle, who is the originator of this argument, himself, as I understand his view, is not in the camp that Josh is in. He is not in the camp that thinks that consciousness is irreducible. He thinks that it is a property, or at least understanding, and I think he would say consciousness as well, that it is produced by neurons in the brain. Um, but it's not reducible to the functions of neurons. Like it's not it's not reducible to a sort of computational functional account um, of those neurons in the way in the way that the computational theorists of mind, the people like um, Jerry Fodor and um, Noam Chomsky, have argued. Um, so so that's what the argument is attempting to to show. It's not supposed to be an argument that the mind is irreducible. Like mind is in some sense fundamentally irreducible. Of course, you you may redeploy it for that, but. Um, so, so that's one issue there. So, so the point is, even if you buy hook, line, and sinker that argument, I, I don't really think that it, that it um, leads you to, to this conclusion that the mind is irreducible. Another point that I want to make here is that notice that we're talking about understanding. Understanding is not the same as the concept of truth and falsity. It's not the same as intentionality, which is mental aboutness. It's not the same as qualia. I, I'm just bringing this up again because I'm talking. Uh, what I'm emphasizing is there are so many different mental phenomena that are being mentioned here. Um, an account of one is not going to necessarily be an account of another. So I think we need a bit more clarity about what we're sort of focused on here. It seems that it's it's more of a throw everything and see what hits kind of approach here. Uh, why not just focus on one or two of these in this video instead of just going all over the place? And now and here we're talking about intentionality and there we're talking about truth and now we're talking about quality and now we're talking about understanding. Uh, so I, I just think that that's, that's confusing because I'm going to say somewhat different things for these, uh, these different phenomena. Um, and... That, that, that kind of confuses the picture because it looks like I'm, well, it, it looks like the materialist is just coming up with different things, but really it, it's the person who's raising these objections that is, I think, mudding the waters a bit because, well, yeah, different phenomena are going to have different explanations. And so we, we need to get some clarity there. Um, so that's the second point that I wanted to make. The third point there is uh, I, I think that the, the, the way that Josh sort of says, is he trying to use this as an argument that function is not enough? I've been talking a lot about function. This is his sort of argument against functionalism. Function's not enough because you can imagine someone who, uh, is in a room that performs all of the functions of um, cons uh, all of the functions consistent with understanding Chinese. You know, they take the symbols in and they um, look up on the book and they produce the the writings that then appear to be uh, consistent with fluent Chinese um, uh, uh, as the output. But the person doesn't clearly understand Chinese. Some people have said that maybe the room as a whole understands Chinese, the person and the books. Um, I, I think that's an interesting thing to think about. But I think that there are other uh, there are other ways to uh, sort of explicate what's gone wrong in this thought experiment. And from my point of view, uh, the way I articulate it is that this notion of function needs to be made more precise. Function is what something does or what it's for. And so in biology, different systems, yeah, different biological components or systems have different functions. And you have to look at it through in terms of levels of analysis that I mentioned before, right? So if you say, what's the function of a cell? Well, it depends on the cell, right? But it's going to have some function consistent with the, the tissue that it's in and the organ that that's part of, and then the organ system and so forth. And then the organism as a whole could be said to have a function in terms of its, um, the, the biological and even the social um, kind of nexus that it operates in. 
we could have a long discussion about that. But the point is that when you are using the notion of function, there's no privileged level of analysis for that. So you can apply function at different levels. In the Chinese room thought experiment, function is applied at the broadest possible level. That is, all that matters is symbols in and symbols out. And we analyze function at that level, which is really kind of a behaviorist level, really. It's just like, what symbols do you take in and what symbols do you put out? And it's and the point of the experiment is we match that function, but we don't have any understanding, again, uh, plausibly. So my counter argument to that is, well, maybe you haven't looked at function at the right level of specificity. Maybe it's not the function of the whole organism that's important for understanding. It's the function of uh, lower order components to that. And what I would identify is components of the cognitive system. So I think that understanding emerges or it is, uh, occurs as a result of a particular form of internal mental representation of, of some phenomena. In this case, it would be Chinese and the meaning of different words, right? This is actually what I work on, the word meaning. Not, not Chinese word meaning, but, but, but word meaning in semantics and how that can be instantiated in the brain. So this is a particular interest to me. So I tend to think about that, and I think a lot of cognitive scientists think about that as some sort of internal mental representation. If you understand, you understand something if you have the right mental representation of it. Now, mental representations could be, understand, could be understood functionally because they perform a function in terms of making inferences and, and uh, sustaining beliefs and making um, uh, judgments and then performing behaviors and so forth. But it's not, it's not, it's not the case that you can just look at the behavioral level and say, well, the behavioral functions are mapped, symbols in, symbols out, and that's all there is to it. No, no, no. The functions at the level of the representations matter as well. A crude way to say this is that just because your, your, um, uh, your um, computer is showing the same video like output, it, it doesn't mean that the, the computations happening inside of it are the same. It could be generating that, those images in different ways. And, and the claim is that, um, not in the case of the computer, but in the case of a mind, like a human mind, the way that it generates those behavioral outputs could well determine whether it understands the material or not. Of course, it's hard to say for sure because understanding is a vague notion. Josh says, well, we know what understanding is because we do it ourselves. I regard that as a mistake, right? That's assuming that we have some sort of direct introspective access to understanding and how it works in the mind. I, I don't see the basis for that. Understanding is a concept that we use to deploy through which we understand <laughs> this is tricky, through which we understand our understanding, right? Uh, I have to use the words to talk about the thing. Uh, but hopefully you get the point, right? That understanding is not just this sort of given that, that we just sort of pick up off the ground when we're uh, three months old or something. It's a concept that we learn to deploy. And that's the sense in which we can say that folk psychology is theory laden. When you say, oh, they understood this. They understand this. I understand this thing. That's a concept that they've deployed in a given context because they believe it's appropriate. It doesn't mean that they've latched onto something in reality that is this understanding that, that, that they've now done. That is, people can think they understand something, but they may not understand it at all. Or they may be just confused about what it means to understand something. They may be inconsistent about the way they deploy the word. In fact, I think that all of these things are the case. How many times, in fact, th th there's, even, there's even empirical work on this. It's called the illusion of explanatory depth. If you ask people, how well do you understand something like a zipper, I think is one thing that they've done research on. Uh, they'll say they understand it really well. But then you ask them to explain how it works and most people can't like at all, or just give very confused and inconsistent answers. Uh, so, so the idea is that familiarity is often confused with understanding. Think about the notion of a thought terminating cliche. It's like, oh, that sounds yeah, really good. I agree with that. But why? Like, why was it so convincing? What, what was so good about it? You, you can't really say it. Just it sounds really convincing and sounds like you really understood it. So that's why it's called thought terminating, right? Or a deepity is a similar notion. Um, there's the phenomena that people rate uh, rate statements as more believable or more true when they rhyme. Uh, I think the famous example, famous example of this is if what was it? It was a I can't remember. Was it the gloves? If the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. From the I think that's from the O.J. Simpson trial. Maybe it wasn't gloves, but someone will correct me if I'm wrong there. But but the point is that there are all sorts of examples about how people get completely muddled about understanding and whether they understand things and and understand and and um sort of uh, identifying understanding in others. Why would we think that we just have this sort of direct access to this? core co uh, cognitive notion of understanding just because like w we have a mind I, I don't i don't really get that like what, what's the what's the basis for that um what i would say is like many aspects of folk psychology the notion of understanding is likely the notion itself is likely to be confused and multifaceted and complicated as well as our deployment of it is likely to be inconsistent and confused and and we confuse familiarity or um or, or beauty or whatever with with understanding and, and we we actually often don't know how well we understand things so um yeah, I don't think we understand understanding very well. I think that it's something we need to work at through scientific inquiry.
And so there's that side of the issue about Searle's room. Understanding is vague. But furthermore, as I've said, the functional side of it also faces the problem that you need to apply functional analysis at the right level. I think humans understand something, broadly speaking, when they have the, cor uh, the correct or the appropriate internal mental representation of that phenomenon. Now, a Chinese room doesn't have the right sort of mental representation um, to qualify as understanding something because a series of rules in a rule book and someone who just follows them without under without understanding them or without having the right form of mental representation doesn't understand them. Um, just like you'd say that uh, a series of instructions in a computer that produces a, a sentences on the screen, uh, that program doesn't understand the sentences because although it can produce them, it doesn't have the right representation that would count as understanding. And if you want to ask, well, in virtue of what does a representation count as understanding? Well, that would be a long question, right? I think it's a whole set of things about um, uh, connection to experience and um, being embedded in a right, the right cognitive architecture and being able to support the right forms of inferences or question answering. There's all sorts of things we could say about that, like what makes a representation count as understanding and, and why some representations don't count. But all you really need here is to say that some forms of representation sufficient to produce a behavior don't count as understanding, whereas others do. There's no there's no contradiction there. All it means is that we have an enriched notion of understanding that's more, uh, I think, detailed than a purely behaviorist level of symbols in, symbols out, or behavior in, behavior out. Um, and, and we apply the functionalist notion to a more fine-grained analysis of the function of, co of different components in a cognitive system, not just the pure system as a whole. Um, again, your computer could be d doing different stuff inside and you still see the same pictures on the screen. Just because you see the same picture doesn't mean the processing is the same. But understanding is a term that refers to the processing, so to speak, or the representations. So I don't think you can just look at the output and infer uh, what the processing must have been. Maybe you can build a machine that can appear to understand Chinese, even if, uh, even if it doesn't actually understand Chinese. You'd need to look under the bonnet and see how it's working in order to tell whether it really did understand Chinese. That would be the argument. So anyway, hopefully that at least gives some um, some ideas about how I think that this this thought experiment here is, um, I would say, being misused, or, or at least I, I would object to the uh, to its deployment here. And I don't think it's a good argument for the irreducibility of the mental. Um, I also want to point out again that look, even if I can't, as a reductionist, explain the Chinese room thought experiment, I don't really know how an irreducible consciousness does any better, because it just seems to be the answer is well, it just does understand because it has an irreducible capacity to understand like wh what's the account H how does that explain anything or, or provide us with a greater understanding I, I don't i don't know what that does to say that it's irreducible that's why i say that it seems to be the end of inquiry to say that something is irreducible and and really doesn't help um so th th that's another issue i have but l let's continue I, I don't want to go on for too much longer we still have a bit of video left yeah how does that tie into the the legos well so again it just shows that complexity um, function syntax rearrangement um, is not going to be a relevant difference. If this Lego is not thinking in virtue of its shape, then giving it a more complex shape, or even a function of shape inputs to shape outputs, is not going to be enough to make it think. That doesn't seem yeah. to be enough. I want, so there's, there's two ways you can make it more complex, is you could add more Legos. That's one way. Or you could even take this one green Lego and cut it up into tiny pieces, yeah. and then reorganize that into like a brain-like structure. Yeah. And I think- You can build actually, a brain out of Legos. Yeah, yeah. that makes me think of uh, you, I, I don't know, I don't remember exactly when you said this, Again, it seems that this is mistaking the, the structure with function. Structure matters for function, but it's not the same. From my point of view, if you could successfully build a brain out of Legos, and I, I don't know how you could do that, but supposing you could and you could replicate its function, not just at the crude overall level, but at the at the detailed architectural level as well, at whatever level is necessary. I mean, from my point of view, what, why wouldn't that be conscious or why wouldn't that be able to understand things? Why wouldn't that be able to exhibit mental, mental phenomena? Um, I can't prove that it would, obviously, because you know no one's done that yet. But I think that there are good theoretical risks for thinking that it could, if we are able to make successful reductions between various mental phenomena and the functional um, uh, and the functional processes that carry them out in the brain, and then in terms of what instantiates those. So uh, one way to think about this is: imagine that I replaced a single neuron in your brain with a synthetic device, which is completely different to a neuron internally, but but exactly mimics the input and output re uh, relationship. Uh, input and output relations of, of that neuron in terms of its electrical activity, let's say. Um, so suppose I did that with just one neuron. Would there be any observable change in your cognition? Almost certainly not, because I mean, you could just kill one neuron and it wouldn't make much difference in most cases. Um, okay, but now let's do it with two neurons, three neurons, four neurons. All of the neurons in your brain? What, what would happen? Um, now, different people will give different answers to this, right? But from my point of view, and I would say a lot of neuroscientists would go along with this as well, but of course you will see a divergence of opinions. Um, 
Well, there's something called the neuron doctrine, which says that the neuron is the fundamental functional unit of at least the brain. Um, and that's been subject to some, uh, some revisionary accounts and disagreement. But uh, without getting into all that here, I would say that pretty widely accepted that the electrical output of a neuron in terms of the timing of action potentials is, is pretty critical. It's at the foundation of how the brain processes information, how it represents things. Um, and so if we can duplicate that with some hypothetical synthetic device, then it's going to be performing pretty much the same. It's going to be doing basically the same thing as a neuron with respect to the cognitive function that it performs, the, the cognitive significance of that, right? Uh, and so if you do that for all neurons in the brain, again, at, at enough level of precision, hypothetically at least, there shouldn't, there shouldn't have any effect, right? Because functionally, they're doing the same thing. That's why I say the functional level analysis is important, but you do have to apply it at the right level of granularity. Maybe the neuron doctrine is wrong and you have to go at a sub, uh, you know, a sub neural level and um, replicate uh, the, the function at the protein level or something. But, but we could just replicate the argument there. Okay, so suppo suppose we build uh, all of the cells out of little, in your brain, out of little Lego blocks and all of the proteins are Lego blocks instead of proteins, instead of made of amino acids, they're made of Lego blocks, right? I mean, at that point, uh, you pretty. Uh, I, I just, I just don't know what what you say if you if you if you want to disagree with a claim that well, then the brain would function essentially the same. You have to be saying that there's something fundamental to amino acids or something that is, um, that that allows brains to have, uh, to give rise to cognitive functions that would be different if you replace them with Lego bricks. Again, hypothetically, function identical Lego bricks. Um, I'm just not sure that that makes a whole lot of sense from my point of view. The, the, the cognition is defined by the, the the functions that it performs within the relevant system, just like digestion is defined by what it does in, in in the context of the system that it exists in. And if you replicate that at the right level of precision, uh, what's missing from that point of view? I mean, you could say that well, there's always going to be something missing, but but the question is, what's the argument for that? Um, anyway, so, so so the point here is, I think that there needs to be serious, uh, um, more careful examination of these claims that they're sort of making here that well if you tried to build a brain out of um out of out of legos it, it just they just sort of wouldn't wouldn't be conscious or wouldn't give rise to intentionality or wouldn't understand or, or something like that and the, i would just ask well well why i mean is that just seems to be assuming that that reductionism is true so i, I don't know that we can use that as an argument for reductionism um and furthermore it, it's sort of unclear what injecting an irreducible mind into the picture adds to that because it's like well at, um, atoms bouncing around apparently can't give rise to consciousness but atoms bouncing around with an some sort of irreducible consciousness somehow connected to it can i, I that, how does that how does that work exactly I, I, again maybe a, a more current account there can be given but i'm certainly not getting that in in this discussion here so what i want to say is what we should do is is we should ensure that we are requiring the same standards of the different theories. If we think that a certain question needs to be answered by a reductionist theory, that same question should also be answered by a, a, an irreducible theory, like a mind is irreducible theory. We, we should hold them to the same standards. So if there's an outstanding question here, we sh it should also be addressed by this other theory. Um, we should ensure that they both have the explain explanatory depth. And if we're just going to say, well, the immaterial uh, or, or, uh, irreducible consciousness just kind of just kind of does allow the the atoms bouncing around then then to give rise to consciousness. I, I just I don't see how that's any better than just saying while the atoms bouncing around just just do give rise to consciousness. It, it, both of them seem to be appealing to brute facts. One is a brute fact about the interactions of atoms. I'm just deliberately going at the lowest level, right? Uh, or neurons, if you like. Uh, but the the interactions of a bunch of atoms in a certain arranged in a certain way just does give rise to consciousness and minds and so forth. The other is to say as well. There are just our immaterial minds, and when there's they're kind of interacting in some way with the right set of matter, then they they just do give rise to consciousness. I, I just don't I don't see how the latter is is um a better view. It just seems to be adding extra stuff in that doesn't add to the explanatory depth. So I, I have a real issue with even if we accept all of the problems with reductionist views, what the irreducibility views uh, seem to add to that. I I don't find that they add any explanatory depth but you were thinking about consciousness one day and you saw like dust particles flying through the yeah. air and you were like are those dust particles conscious yeah i saw it through the sun in the air and i was like I'm, if i'm certain of anything it's that those dust particles are not thinking thoughts right, yeah. right? there's also this binding problem like well which particles are bound together to have that first person experience is it these 20 over here or is it these 15 right and so even if those dust particles look like a brain even if they're shaped like a brain even if they're functioning like a brain that's not by itself enough now at this point cameron 
there are people watching this and they are itching with an objection, a neuroscience objection. Okay. They're thinking, okay, Josh, you can speculate philosophically, but we know the brain generates consciousness. We know that consciousness comes from the matter of the brain. So maybe consciousness doesn't come from Legos, but we already know, maybe it's a mystery how this happens, but we already know somehow the brain is doing all the work, mm -hmm. generating consciousness. And here, and I don't think they would necessarily just need to be relying on neuroscience. Right. They could say the, the, one of the problems that's raised all the time is the uh, interaction problem. Is that what's called? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Dualism interaction. It's like how, how does that actually happen? How does yeah. the immaterial interact with material? Yeah. How that's is one. That's a, yeah. That's a big issue that's raised a lot. So it wouldn't be necessarily that you know it's just like relying on the facts about neuroscience or anything or like consensus of what neuroscientists think. Yes. It'd be like there's also this problem of interaction. How does that interaction take place? If it does. Yeah. There are a number. There are a host of, of different um, problems and questions that one can ask. And oh, also, and then another one I was thinking about. Sorry, I, I yeah, can't go, feel please. like I'm interrupting no. you a ton. Uh, it, another one is like, you know, if you get a brain injury, yeah. that really affects your personality. The brain that affects your thoughts. Yeah. yeah. And all this, I think what it shows is there is a correlation between the brain states, the, the, the third person material structural states, mm -hmm. and these conscious states. There is a correlation there. Um, but there's different ways we can analyze that correlation. Um, so, you know, we talked about the three views, the eliminativist view, the reductionist view, and the something more view. Um, you, if, if, if there's a correlation, then you don't want to eliminate consciousness because what we're saying is consciousness is real, but it's correlated. correlated. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that doesn't entail the reductionist view. It, it's sort of like if, if I'm listening to music, my wife is playing music on the uh, piano and she's, she does a great job of this and I'm listening to this. There's a correlation between the piano keys and the sounds I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. But the sounds I'm hearing aren't the same as the piano keys. In fact, we can demonstrate this because we could actually move piano keys in the same way without there being those same sounds if it's not hooked up in the right way. Mm -hmm. So you could just take all the strings out of the piano. Yeah, you could take the strings out. Um, or the sun rises and then roosters crow but the sun is not a rooster. The rising of the sun is not the crowing of a rooster. So there's correlation. There's not thereby uh, reduction. Mm. So um, I think that actually what the neuroscience is showing us from my reading of the neuroscience is, and it's really fascinating, Cameron, because they're talking about quantum brain theory. Uh, I wanted to let him finish, but the, the quantum brain theory, yes. Uh, I, I don't even want to talk about that here. I just don't know why he's even bringing it up. But the, let's talk a bit about this this idea of correlation and causation. I, I, I don't understand this, this argument. It seems really strange to me. So the idea is that there's clearly a correlation between, so let's say, brain activity and mental activity. No one disputes that. Okay, fine. Um, but then, according to well, like Josh and, and others who make this argument, well, we can't, you know, correlation isn't causation, right? So we can't say that the mind, sorry, that the brain is sufficient to cause the mind just because we see a correlation between them. Uh, and that's, I think, what, what we were seeing in, with the piano analogy and, and some of the other things he said there. Now, the issue here seems to be that the claim is not just that there is a correlation between brain activity and mental activity. The claim is that, in fact, by the same way that we analyze causal relations, well, pretty much everywhere else, we, we, we would also, uh, when applied to the mind-brain relation, we would also identify a causal relation. So what I mean by that is you can't, we don't know of any way of creating a mind without creating a corresponding brain and having the right uh, activity in that brain as well. So it's not just a correlation in the sense that like most of the time you have a relevantly structured mind and a relevantly structured brain. Like all of the time that you have the mind, you have the, the relevantly structured brain. You don't know of any way of getting the mind without the brain. Um, now, I suppose if you believe in God, maybe that's an exception. But if this is supposed to be an argument for God, then that becomes a bit question begging. But also that, that's not observable in the same way that you know, human minds are anyway. So, uh, so, so there's that side of it. But also um, we know that if you take someone who does have a functioning brain and mind and then say, cut off their head. I mean, there's other things you do as well. You can uh, poke sticks through their um, parts of their frontal cortex and uh, destroy parts of their brain. Um, that will disrupt parts of their mind. If you cut off their head, that will completely disrupt their mind. Uh, in fact, if you transiently lesion parts of the cortex using um, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you can cause them to remember certain very specific uh, sights or sounds or smells or forget certain things or disrupt a very particular cognitive activities depending on the part of the brain that you lesion. Um, if you uh, expose a, a person to particular drugs, that has specific and repeatable effects on the mental activity uh, and me mental phenomena, uh, mental life of that person, including subjective, you know, feelings of um, well-being and, or um, depression and so forth, right? Anxiety. And I could go on, right? So, so but the point is here that it's more than a correlation. We, we seem to have multiple lines of interventionary type evidence about how interventions in the brain lead to specific reproducible effects on the mind. Um, likewise, we never see minds in the absence of the appropriate brain. Now, this is not a proof that the brain is sufficient 
for the mind or that there aren't other substances. But I would say it goes well beyond there being a mere correlation. And so I think that these analogies to um, other systems where I, I think, I can't remember if he said this or he's about to say, it, but the one is that, well, the, you know, that the rooster crows at dawn, but we know that the rooster doesn't cause the dawn. Yeah, but the issue is, can you have, to make the analogy complete, we'd have to say that, well, you can never actually have the sunrise without the rooster crowing. And we also know that when you kill the rooster, uh, the sun doesn't rise. Well, if that was the case, then I would say it seems like the rooster probably is causing the sunrise. If you can never have sunrises without roosters, if you manipulate the rooster, the sunrise changes. And if you kill the rooster, you can never have a sunrise. Now, that, that sounds pretty pretty solid evidence that the rooster is causing the sunrise. But of course, that's not how roosters work when sunrises works, because that's just a correlation not the case with brains and minds. So I, I find this argument that it's it's a correlation and not causation to be really weak. Now, again, the fact that um, all of this evidence that I cite don't prove that there isn't something further, but what I would ask is, what is the explanatory benefit that we gain, the added insight that we gain from postulating anything beyond what we already know? Like no one disputes the brain exists in some sense, at least, even if you're an idealist, you know, that, that something that there is to the brain but josh isn't an idealist so i don't want to go down that path here but the point is that everyone agrees the brain exists but there is deep dispute about whether um there is and again i, I guess the eliminative is say that minds don't necessarily exist but here i want to focus on the particular point with respect to the reductionists um reductionists and um irreducible people i don't know that there's a term for it people who believe in an irreducible mind both agree that brains and minds exist the difference is whether we think that there's something added beyond brains needed to give rise to the mind or or brains and brain activity i should say to give rise to minds or whether um brains and brain activity is sufficient to give rise to minds or, or to constitute minds if you prefer that language um and so from my point of view we need a we need an account that uh, that that includes irreducible minds that provides greater explanatory depth and power and scope and and plausible and has you know sufficient plausibility and so forth. We have to have those the theoretical virtues exemplified by an account which includes irreducible minds, and, and only then should we accept that uh, to add to our ontology, so to speak. And I think that that's how broadly science reasons that you you have a theory that postulates a certain entity. Um, if the theory is sufficiently successful, that gives you reason for thinking that the entity is part of reality. So. The question is, what great, what additional insight does ir do irreducible minds provide? And it's just not clear to me what what they're, what they're supposed to be. Um, and I think that that's really what what the focus should be, rather than this sort of correlation argument, which I, I, I don't I don't think really gets to the heart of the matter here. Where there's consciousness through thinking, through mindfulness, that's having an impact and changing the structures of the brain. You can heal your brain, you can build your brain through certain mental disciplines. And they're not actually finding physical correlates to explain these physical changes. That doesn't mean, in principle, those physical correlates aren't there. But it, what it shows is that there's an interpretive option here that allows for consciousness, consistent with all that we know from neuroscience, that consciousness is, is not reducible to brain structure and may actually be causing brain structure uh, without any physical mechanisms to explain that. So maybe that's one way to understand the correlation issue. But then what about the other one, the interaction problem? So that, you know, this is a very deep problem. My own account of uh, mind-body interaction is I call it a substance view. Uh, so I developed this in terms of substances having basic capacities to generate thoughts, feelings, mental imagery, as well as the kind of states that we might associate with material states. Um, I'm still kind of working through how, I, how to think of matter. What is the fundamental nature of matter? Bernardo Castro, he, he understands matter as a kind of extrinsic appearance of consciousness itself. So that's kind of an intriguing idea that matter is itself fundamentally a reflection of consciousness, the very nature of matter. Um, I'm, I'm kind of leaving that open at this point, but basically I think that if you have a substance that's capable of generating consciousness in a basic way, then it could also generate other states and correlate those states together so that you don't get you don't get shapes generating consciousness and you actually don't get thoughts generating shapes directly which you get as a thinking substance or thinking being that's capable of generating both the brain as well as conscious states if that was, makes sense i was gonna say that it seems like this interaction problem is like so how do we how i don't pretend at all to understand what josh's view is from these remarks uh so i, I don't want to say too much about this sort of dual aspect thing other than that the language reminds me of what uh, Ryan philosophy says about this, but I don't know if Josh would call himself an idealist, for instance. So um, I, I don't really want to get into that. But what I do want to say is this this notion of, um, uh, yeah, he mentioned something about substances having uh, fundamental causal powers or properties, something like that. I may have not got the wording precisely the same as he did, but I mean, this is an interesting idea. I, I'm not necessarily completely averse to the idea of substances having specific causal powers, but but notice the issue here is where if we're to say that there is some sort of immaterial substance, which is a mind, like an irreducible mind, um, and that 
in virtue of being such a substance, it has so and so causal powers, like to give rise to, I guess, thoughts and intentionality and subject and and um, subjective experiences and and so forth. Um, I, I don't really see that as much of an explanation. It's just saying these things that we want to explain are irreducible properties of this substance that just just is defined to have those properties. By irreducible here, I mean they're not true in virtue of anything more fundamental. They they just they just they're true. They're just sort of brute facts that that's the way it is. Um, whereas that's not how we think about things scientifically, unless we're dealing with fundamental physics. And even there, scientists are always trying to probe the deeper reason for things and the deeper structure to it. Um, I, I don't know that this notion of irreducibility has a place anywhere in science, to be honest. Uh, I guess there'll be people who disagree with that. But 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 all, always in science, we're looking for deeper explanations, deeper causes, deeper links between things. Um, and and the notion that something's just irreducible and, and there's no further explanation for it or nothing further to say about it. Uh, or no further reason for why it pertains. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there are such things, right? In, in reality, um, but I don't. I don't know how we could know that we'd reach those. And, and just particularly in the case of, a, of something like the mind, which is so poorly understood and such a com very complicated, intricate activity, like in terms of all the things that are happening, to say that all of this stuff is irreducible for some basic substance, I just, I, I find it really hard to take that seriously, to be honest. Why? Well, because it seems that there is so much that we can say about these phenomena in terms of like cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, linguistics, anthropology artificial intelligence and so forth. And, and we have made a lot of progress in understanding these things. Um, I just don't think they're irreducible. There are, so, they, they, there are so many things we can say about how they can be reduced to more fundamental components in terms of neural systems, in terms of um, functional components of like language, in terms of logical relations. Um, uh, I mean, without getting into all the specifics that, that would take too long here, I, I just, I can't see how to reconcile that kind of analysis with, well, there are just these immaterial substances that just have a bunch of these sort of these uh, causal powers that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me it's or to put it another way it just seems like a really bad explanation again what is better about that explanation than simply saying um so what is better about saying there is an there's some sort of irreducible mental substance that has a causal power of intentionality or uh subjective experience or whatever what is better about that than just saying well a bunch of neurons arranged in a certain way with a certain set of activity just has the ability to, or just does produce subjective experiences, or just does produce belief states. Like I, I don't see, I, I don't see how that's worse. Um, both are postulating that a certain thing has causal powers. One is postulating a sort of a, a basic brute causal power of the substance. The other is saying that it is, um, dare I say, emergent. That that word is is overused, and I see people debunking about that in chat. But but one arises from the complex interactions of a a system of things that are themselves made up of more basic components. So, so both are sort of stipulating that. It's just the one requires us, it seems, to add extra stuff into our ontology, which gives rise to things like the interaction problem. So, so why do it? I, I, I don't see, I don't see the payoff in terms of what we're explaining that that uh, gives us greater explanatory depth. So, this is why I think that typically people in the literature, at least that I've seen, will argue for this not on an explanatory framework, like that it accounts for things better, but just that they'll try to use deductive arguments that, in principle, reductionism can't work. Um, and so you don't actually have to have a, a better explanatory account. Now, I don't think that those arguments are successful. Um, I'm not sure exactly what Josh's view on them, but he hasn't really presented those here. I mean, he did present Searle's argument, but I'm not sure if that was supposed to be a deductive argument against a functionalist account um, or if it was supposed to be an illustrative thought experiment. Because, uh, yeah, anyway, without, without getting into all of that, to me, it's unclear whether Josh is here making sort of um, inference to best explanation type arguments or whether he's making deductive arguments. It seems mostly it's an appeal to the explanatorily, explanatory inadequacies of reductionism because that's mostly what he's been talking about. And if that's the issue, then you have to show that you have um, greater resources to uh, account for, uh, to provide a better explanation rather, uh, under the, um, the the alternative view, the irreducible consciousness view or irreducible mind view. And, and I, I don't see that that's really substantiated here. And I see that's a fundamental problem. If you're going to appeal to explanatory inadequacy as a problem for one view, then you have to show explanatory superiority from another view. And just saying that, well, there's a bunch of these properties that, sub, that immaterial substances, sorry, that irreducible mental substances just have, how is that explanatory? It certainly doesn't fit with the way we, we tend to explain things in science. And um, I, I would I would question what philosophical insight it gives us uh, at the same time. So I, I, yeah, for that reason and for the reason that it does seem like reductive analyses are possible because we do that in a lot of disciplines. They're not complete, but we, we I've say made a lot of progress there. Um, I regard these these um, attempted alternate theories as as pretty implausible.
how do these things interact? And that's yeah. a question about like maybe the sort of mechanisms that are involved. Yeah. There's just a real big gap in our knowledge of how this works. Yeah, right? in general. I mean, how anything interacts. Well, yeah, yeah. but yeah, and that's one yeah. that's one of the ways that I've thought is like, how do we even know that like material how do material things interact with each other? Yeah. That's super weird too. Especially when you get down to like, you know, quantum levels and stuff. Like, exactly. How does any of this stuff work at all in the at first place? At some level, there's just something basic. Yeah. But the, the other thing I was gonna say is that like what we were talking about at the very beginning of this, it's like, how does consciousness come out of the brain? Yeah. You know, how, if we can't just like put shapes together or colors together and get consciousness. So like it doesn't matter who you are, you're still gonna get to a place where you just don't understand how that happens. Yeah, well, and I want to just say that I don't think... So that's true. An explanation is never going to be complete unless we somehow have a theory of everything. So I agree with that point. But the question is, which theory gives you better explanatory depth and insight relative to the theoretical postulates that it makes, the complexity of the theory, if you like? Um, and so uh, th this appears to be a very explicit reference to some sort of comparative explanatory virtues uh, type of argument here. So the question is, what does appeal to these irreducible mental substances or whatever, what does that give us in terms of explanatory insight? It's almost like Cameron said there that it doesn't give you any great insight because he says, well, you have to, you have to sort of bottom out somewhere. Um, but, but the question is when, when, when your theory is considered in the, in the context of the, the overall, um, you know, set of, set of beliefs that it commits you to, which is a better theory, like which gives you better explanatory depth relative to the postulates made. And I, I just don't see the argument that postulating these extra entities beyond beyond the physical um, components of the world that we seem to be all committed to but what what does it add to what does it add to our understanding about any of these phenomena? I, I don't see them as explanatory i see the scientific reductive approaches as already having significant insights to say granted with a lot of uh, a lot of progress still to make i see these irreducible accounts as extremely hard to reconcile with these reductive accounts um and as providing no greater explanatory depth so i guess the question would be what do they help us to explain or to understand that reductive approaches like those pursued in cognitive psychology you know uh cognitive linguistics artificial intelligence neural networks biological investigations into into cognition uh all of that sort of stuff right which which we have to talk about uh, at length if needed um how does the irreducible stuff fit with that and or add anything to that also i would add as i mentioned before I don't think that science really is committed to any particular stopping points of inquiry. I think that that's one of the hallmarks of science. There may be limits to our current ability to theorize and understand and, and to collect empirical evidence. So, but but the idea that that's a sort of a stopping point where it's just like, you know, hit, um, beyond here, no further theory or understanding can uh, can investigate. I, I, I don't think that's part of science, right? I think that it's part of a lot of philosophical theories that certain things are just brute, they're just fundamental and nothing more can be said about them. But I'm actually quite... Uh, pretty skeptical of, of, of those sorts of theories because they just sort of seem to be throwing up our hands and 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 announcing the end of inquiry when well i mean it, it's not over until it's over right inquiry continues and, and if your theory just kind of says that there's no further inquiry to make i would ask well how do you know that there's nothing further to say about that so, so this this notion of things being irreducible and fundamental and nothing more to be said i, I think we should regard that with a lot of skepticism I think consciousness can come out of any purely material structure any material. So, so whether it's Legos or brain, none of that's going to be sufficient. That's why I think what you need is the right kind of substance. And this is where, um, I, whether we call this a mental substance, a conscious substance, spiritual substance, it's the kind of thing that can generate consciousness. It can think, it can feel, it can even generate the imagery of a brain. So I think the conscious substance is going to be prior. Um, so when people talk about consciousness coming from a brain, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's that's how I would I would analyze. I don't think strictly conscious, I don't think purely material realities anywhere of any shape, size, form, or structure could ever in principle, produce thoughts or feelings. Maybe this is a good way to wrap up. Yeah, so that's a very strong claim, right? Um, he says, could not uh, any material structure could not, in principle, produce uh, mental phenomena. Uh, now, I don't think he's come close to justifying that, which is fine. He may not have been intending to justify that claim, because I, I don't think that that's really what he was arguing. I think he was more trying to show, because remember, there were the three theories. There's eliminativism, there's reductivism, and then there's irreducibleism. And um, he was showing some of the inadequacies of the first two, and maybe some of the virtues of the third, although I don't really know that he illustrated that, like what are the virtues of the third? Um, but anyway, um, and so that appears to be more a compa comparative explanations account, not an in principle impossible account, which is what he just sort of said here. Um, so, so that's fine if, if he hasn't argued that here. I, I, I'm not saying that he, that he has to, but I would be very interested to what an argument like that looks like. And I feel like it probably just looks like uh, this is based on what he said here and other things that I've read about these sorts of arguments. It probably just looks like an appeal to certain intuitive pro uh, aspects of, uh, of thoughts and minds and an argument from incredulity that those can ever come from interacting bits of matter. And I just I just find it so hard to take those sorts of arguments really seriously. I mean, I, I try to because, you know, well, smart people do take these things seriously. But 
the way that I think about these things informed by cognitive science and neuroscience and linguistics and all these disciplines um, that take a reductive approach to these mental phenomena and I think make at least reasonable steps and have in, uh, informative, useful things to say about all of these cognitive phenomena indicates that, that they're not irreducible and that many of the intuitive things that we think we, we, we know about them are not in fact correct. Uh, so that undermines folk psychology, undermines these intuitive notions, and also shows that there are like productive, reducible things to say about these these mental phenomena. And, and the broad, also to add to that, the broader project of reductionism in biology, in terms of understanding complicated phenomena like digestion or the immune system, in terms of ultimately like protein interactions, uh, has been extremely successful. And I don't really see why we should expect the mind to be fundamentally different. The arguments as to why it is fundamentally different just seem to me to be based on incredulity that something that feels so immediately familiar to us, you know, thoughts and perceptions and so forth could ever be explained by bits of proteins interacting with each other. But it seems to me you could make just the same argument about the weather or the economy or social systems or or digestion or the immune system or uh, metabolism broadly or, or life, like in terms of cellular life or genetics, all sorts of things that don't seem how like pre-theoretically, intuitively, introspectively, how you could get these things from bits of proteins pushing around against each other. Um, but presumably we do think that that's where those things come from. And therefore, um, it seems that our intuitions about such things are just not very reliable. Um, I've talked about some of the empirical evidence that those sorts of intuitions are, are unreliable. And there's much more to be said about that. So this is sort of the, I think I have good reason for, for not taking these sorts of arguments very seriously or finding it hard to take them seriously. At least I do try to take them seriously because I think that we should in terms of disagreement types of issues, you know, but um, yeah, I, I'm looking for reasons to take them more seriously, but I, I feel like it really often does come down to strong intuitions and appeals to incredulity. Um, and I think that current scientific knowledge plus the history of scientific progress really m mitigates against uh, thinking that those are very good reasons. Anyway, let's try to finish this out. I want to get to bed soon. The interview is to just talk about that a little bit more. How do you get to that conclusion yeah. that material stuff can't even, in principle, produce something that's conscious? Yeah. Because that can lead, you know, it doesn't necessarily lead to dualism, right? Right. It could just lead to that, you know, mental reality is fundamental. It could be that that's right. idealism is true or something, you know, some other Sure, theory. yeah. And, and my own view is a kind of substance monist. So I, I think I'm one substance, um, but I do think there's a dual aspect or dual properties mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, conscious properties and material properties. But yeah, so Cameron, this is the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah. When I was in graduate school, I was fascinated and I discovered this problem that they named it. This is Chalmers coined the term, the hard problem. It's like, it is know, a hard problem. Could, could there be a more creative name, right? It's like, <laughs> let's just call this the hard problem, right? And um, it, it's the problem of explaining first person subjective experiences out of purely third person geometric uh, structural uh, properties. And what Chalmers observes is that if we understand that consciousness is real, we don't eliminate it. And we understand that its reality is witnessed by our own first person experience. So we're seeing it as it is. Mm -hmm. There's a real aboutness. There's real truth value. There's real logical links. There's real subjectivity. We see that. Then we can also see that there's nothing in the third person material reality that in and of itself allows us to deduce or derive consciousness. And this is why Chalmers is thinking that consciousness is a basic feature of our reality. It's fundamental. Yeah, so I think that's a fundamental mistake there. Well, two fundamental mistakes. One is to say that we we see these things through introspection. We He says something like, we see it as it is. Uh, that's an assumption, right? Uh, how do you know that we see it as it is? That's what the eliminativists are really strong on. And again, I, I agree with a lot of that, although I don't go quite as far as they do. Um, how do you know that you're seeing it as it is? I think that we have overwhelming evidence that we're usually not seeing it as it is, or at least we're seeing a distorted version of it. Uh, one way to say this is that these sort of introspective observations or, or beliefs formed on the basis of introspection are theory laden. We take these concepts from folk psychology, we use them to think about um, to think about what we observe in, in sort of our interior minds, and then we declare that we have some sort of direct access to the, the functionings of the mind. Uh, this seems to be hubris to me. W why think that we see things directly as they are? Even an example here that from earlier, he said, uh, Josh mentioned uh, logical relations like and and or. Um, even that way of phrasing it, it is theory laden. Thinking about them as logical relations in this way that we describe them seems to be uh, derived from late 19th century um, uh, Freudian logic. I mean, granted, ideas of logic are much older than that, but but in terms of that that particular description, seems to me drawing heavily on that particular theoretical framework. Even if it's not that particular one, other logics that people have come up with, right? Um, I, I think clearly, just in that example, be, being um, incorporated into into that um, into what he's describing as just sort of direct access to the way his mind works. Um, I don't think we have such access. I think there's good empirical reasons to think we don't, and good theoretical reasons to think that. Uh, that, that it's not so simple as that. So that was one mistake, I think, from my point of view, at least, to, to just draw this, this sort of simple link between introspection and, and the, the reality of the mind. 
Um, now, the other point that, that he mentions is um, to talk about the geometric, remember, the geometric structure came back again. And and the mistake there is to confuse or, or essentially to eliminate function fr from the story. To understand cognition, we're going to under need to understand it functionally, the function of different parts of cognition and how they and how the that is reduced to then structural elements. So again, you understand genes through the function they perform. You understand proteins through the function they perform in, in the in the organism. You understand organs in terms of the function that they perform. Likewise, you should understand the brain as a whole, the cognitive system as a whole, and parts of that cognitive system, like memory and perception and inference and whatever else, as having particular functions. Function all the way down, so to speak. Fun function and structure are related, but you can't just sort of forget about the, the function and just talk geometrically and, and have these blocks and talk about the, the colors and the, the, the shapes of them and so forth. That level of analysis is, I think, fundamentally wrong for understanding uh, the mind. The mind is not fundamentally a geometric structure. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's a series of functions that are performed to do particular things. Uh, and obviously, as I've argued, we have to apply that functional analysis at the right level. I don't think it's sufficient to just apply it at the organismal level in the way that uh, John Searle does in his Chinese room argument, where it's just symbol in, symbol out. I think it's more more complicated than that. We need to look at the functions of different parts of the system and what they do. And so it's an issue of the correct representations, for for example, in the case of having understanding. But I mean, you know, we could discuss that further. But but the point is, he, here's the other mistake that I think Josh has made repeatedly, which is to, he basically seems to think about about the brain as if it's a purely geometric object that somehow doesn't do anything. It doesn't have functions and doesn't have uh, parts that, that interact in certain ways. I mean, I'm not saying that he explicitly would say that, but the way he talks about it and the way he uses the blocks analogy and, and talks about the properties and geometric so forth, uh, we, we seem to have missed function. And, and it seems that if you talked about any other, um, any other human um, organ system this way, like the, uh, the, the immune system or the digestive system or the urinary system, you would be as equally puzzled as to how anything, how that does anything, how you get any of these phenomena. How, how do you get an immune system out of, you know, just like bits of cells that come from the bones and, and float around the um, lymphatic uh, system and, and so forth? Like it, it doesn't really make sense, right? Obviously structure matters to the immune system, but function does too. You need that functional analysis. And so that's the other mistake here. I think he he, he continually sort of omits that when he starts talking in, ter in reductionist terms. I don't think he's unique in doing that, by the way, but I think that that's particularly noticeable in this video. A number of other philosophers think this. That's a basic feature of our reality. It's mm -hmm. fundamental. Now, I would go further. I would actually say that not only is there this hard problem of explaining how you could get consciousness from geometric third-person reality, but there's that deep construction problem that it's actually just categorically impossible. It's actually possible to see through reason. I don't claim this is easy to see. I feel like I've, I've come to see it with a greater clarity after working through my book and thinking about the specific elements of consciousness, thoughts, feelings, value itself, seeing these things, that you can just see that, that you can't construct them out of um, just third-person bits of matter. Yeah. And I think this is why you have Alexander uh, Rosenberg saying that clumps of matter can't be about other clumps of matter. I think he's actually seeing rightly. He's taking the hard problem seriously. He's taking it seriously, yeah. So here's the last question I've got, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. I really hate it when, well, I want to say a philosopher, but I often hear this from Christian apologists, that they will compliment people that disagree with them by saying that they take something seriously. But what they mean by that is just that they agree with them on one particular point. See, I think I take the hard problem seriously. But I don't think that clumps of matter can't be about other clumps of matter. That is, I do think clumps of matter can be about other clumps of matter. I don't see the problem there. Um, just as clumps of matter can digest other parts of other clumps of matter and, um, you know, cl cl some clumps of matter correspond to transactions in an economic system. Some clumps of matter can own other clumps of matter. You know, like when you say it like that, it sounds silly. But if you just go through the proper levels of reduction and think about functional uh, relations at those levels, you do the science. Um, I think that you, you, you achieve some clarity, to use Josh's language, about how that kind of works. Maybe not in all details, but more than you get by just saying it's irreducible a substance that just has those properties. But that's not what insight do you get there? You've just redescribed the phenomenon. So how is one taking it more seriously than the other? I I, I don't anyway. The, the taking seriously thing annoys me, but but also I just I I really don't like the faux kind of reductionism that you get in talking about bits of matter thinking about or, or being about other bits of matter. Again, just substitute that from any other higher order property. Can one bit of matter X or Y another bit of matter? Put put any other higher order phenomenon there and it will sound kind of dumb, right? But it seems like it's probably true, right? Um, in terms of, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, let's see. Can one bit of matter, um, can one bit of matter cause a... Um, cause a global pandemic in 
because of being another bit of matter? Well, well, yes, like if it's a virus and it infects people and it's infectious in a certain way. But but if you say, well, one bit of matter caused the infection, one bit of matter spread through other bits of matter caused the global economy to crash. Well, hang on, that sounds well, not crash, but you know there, there was a lot of uh, a lot of issues with the the stock markets back in early twenty twenty. You know, it sounds ridiculous when when you put it that way. Um, that's because you're doing reductionism in a stupid way. <laughs> so um, th that's not how science works. You don't go right from the top, right from the bottom and draw a straight reduction between them and say, well, look, this in terms of this. Uh, why is it okay to do that for consciousness or, or mental activity when we wouldn't do that for anything else? That, that, that That's sort of what I don't get. Why do we think that this the same kind of functional reductive, but piecewise reductive analysis that we use for understanding any other complex phenomenon from weather to economies, to social systems, to digestive systems, the immune system, epidemiology, um, earthquakes, and so on and so forth. Why is that somehow not able to give an account as to how certain neural systems give rise to mental phenomena? I don't feel that there's a good reason for thinking that other than these kind of personal incredulity arguments based on introspective evidence. You know, I feel like I'm repeating myself here, but I suppose that's how it goes. We're almost done. Uh, is you've, you and I have talked at length on numerous occasions about the argument from contingency yeah. for God's existence. But as I understand it, you put, please put the Legos down because they're distracting me. <laughs> uh, the, the argument from contingency is my favorite argument for God's existence. Mm -hmm. But lately, I think I asked you this or you, you mentioned it the other day, is that like the argument from consciousness is, is more powerful to you these days and it's like a, a more clear link to God's it, existence? It, it makes this sort of materialist frame where mindlessness is fundamental just absurd to my mind. And, and, and it didn't always seem this way. I remember when I was in college, not thinking this at all. But the closer that I inspect it, the bigger the problems are. You know, there's some problems in philosophy where you inspect it and then it sort of falls away on scrutiny. Consciousness is not one of those things. The more I inspect the aspects of consciousness, the more it just breaks the materialist frame for me. That, that sort of mindless foundations, um, that you know, rationality itself, mm -hmm. this conversation, our ability to move our limbs and, and to think rationally, that, that all of this is just a product of this mindless motions. Um, there's not only just probability problems there, but there's just this in principle construction problem. It's, I think, the same insight that leads me to think that those Legos aren't thinking thoughts and could never think thoughts no matter how I arrange them. It's sort of that same clarity that I have about no matter how you rearrange the matter, mm -hmm. it's just not going to think. And it just, it clicks. It's just, it's something that does seem very compelling to my mind. I've yeah. said like five times that I'm going to end this, but I don't want to. So uh, I'm thinking about Graham Oppie's view of the foundation of reality, yeah. which is like that it's all necessary or like everything, all the different possible worlds go back to one initial thing that yeah. is necessary. He doesn't want to say it's God or has any kind of mental properties or consciousness or anything. So how would we tie this argument into because he accepts the first stage of yeah. the contingency argument so how would this inform what we think about the nature of fundamental reality like the necessary part of reality so in the last three minutes here we now bring things back to what really matters which is god uh, of course it's all got to come back to god i mean it's a christian apologetics channel so i suppose that makes sense um yeah let me just play it out and hear what they have to say and then i'll comment well you that grounds everything else that's contingent yeah no, how would is... this argument sort of bridge that gap right that, that's kind of the no this is the biggest question, question. I, i've been thinking a problem. lot about this because Oppie's view is, is beautiful. Uh, he talks about how reality can come out of this initial item that has a necessary existence. And then there's this further question, okay, well, what's the best account of, that, of the nature of this item? Well, if we go with the consciousness is fundamental, then this fundamental item That's is going to have some basic consciousness, right? And, and a number of philosophers are saying this who aren't theists in, in their background. You have um, philosophers from a variety of physicalist perspectives who are saying that consciousness looks like it's a fundamental aspect of physical reality. Now, if this initial item is, has necessary existence and it has fundamental consciousness, I actually don't mind calling it physical. I mean, what does the word physical mean? I mean, Cameron, I'm, I'm reading these quantum field theorists and they're talking about the fabric of physical reality as being informational, observer dependent, relational. I'm thinking, well, observers can provide the relata of the relations, um, transcending space and time. This is the nature of, of physical reality, yeah. right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, we can call that physical reality. Maybe this would be a helpful way of bridging a gap here. If I wasn't so tired, I might get more angry. At the, I mean, I've watched this before, but maybe Josh should just not read quantum field theories. <laughs> Granted, there are some people who say some wacky things based on quantum field theory, but uh, yeah, no, that, <laughs> no, no. Let's just say that and move on. You're just saying, yeah, the best account of physical reality is that it's conscious um, or it's got conscious aspects, mm -hmm. fundamental conscious aspects, has necessary existence. It's got enormous power. And, um, you know, the word physical is, is a term of art, but it's, it's real. You know, it's a real thing. And I think that is a way of maybe bridging the gap in the stage two of the, the argument of from mm -hmm. it's another route this sort of argument from consciousness it, it's different from my argument from shaving off the arbitrary limits looking for the simplest uh, account of it in terms of a supreme nature 
but it's sort of mutually reinforcing. It's sort of like yeah. a, a web with many lines that reinforce each other. In your book, How Reason Can Lead to God, you kind of just look at all of these different aspects of reality that kind of point back to the, yeah. the, the, the foundation having these, these sort of divine properties. Yeah. And then this next book on consciousness, I just zoom in on this one aspect, consciousness. And I divide that aspect in many different aspects. And I find that in all those different aspects, that was kind of the discovery for me was to see that each aspect, thoughts, feelings, um, value, uh, even our ability to choose, each one in their own way is a flag that points or is a sign. I don't know what the best metaphor is, but each one points independently to the role of mind as prior to these elements of consciousness. Mm. This has been really helpful, I feel like, and very insightful. I think that we originally talked about doing uh, this completely different, but I'm glad that you had the, the props and stuff and you brought this. Yeah, thank you. I think we covered the, the topics. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. All right, let's make a few comments and, and finish up here. So, um, yeah, li linking this to an argument for God by saying that, well, if if mind is at its fundamental uh, and ir irreducible, then that points to God because God is also a, a fundamental or irreducible mind or something like that. Uh, that that's really weak to me. I mean, God is a very specific type of mind. I don't know where the all-powerful and all-good uh, and omnipresent come from. None of those things are entailed by uh, minds being I irreducible. Um, I mean, you could have a plurality of minds. You could have some sort of... Um, so, so, well, you could have a panpsychist view, of course, but you, you could also have some sort of, um, not sure how to describe this exactly, but some sort of un, uh, maybe undifferentiated mentality, which then sort of separates out or bubbles out into distinct persons or something. I, I don't know how that would work exactly, but the point is it, you, you don't just get God out of that. I, 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 don't, I don't know how you get a single monadic, uh, but tr also triune, uh, maybe you don't get triune, but, but anyway, you, you get a single omnipotent, omnibenevolent, um, omnipresent and all the other omnis uh being uh, that's the creator of everything uh, out of the fact that mentality is fundamental i i just don't see that at all um but anyway so there wasn't a lot said on that so i won't belabor that point other than that there's many many more steps to get to an argument from god out of this i don't really think it gets you uh it gets you very far at all actually and just raises further problems like well then if mentality is at the foundation of reality and God is fundamentally mental, then why did he create the physical at all? What does that, what does that do for him? It just seems to cause problems. Uh, anyway, but that, that's another discussion. So um, in terms of, uh, it feels like camera is staring into my soul with that. Uh, let's change it to something else. That's better. So uh, <laughs> um, what else did I want to say there? Yes. Yeah, so this, this idea about, um, this idea about consciousness and the mind coming out of, um, coming out of physical interactions. I think that, this really shouldn't be as mysterious as many people make it out to be. I think that it's fundamentally a, com a combination of, and this is maybe me psychologizing a bit, but so, uh, so, so it is, a combination of lack of imagination with an overtrust of intuition and um, like pre-theoretic judgments combined with a lack of understanding about just what uh, scientific approaches uh, have uh, have to say about cognition generally and and i don't just mean neuroscience there for some reason everyone goes to neuroscience even though i'm a neuroscientist or i think of myself that way and i really like neuroscience i don't even think that that's necessarily the the most important one to go to just just look at like cognitive linguistics cognitive psychology um different models of processes that are used there uh, artificial intelligence all of these are approaches to understand and study systematically and reductively different aspects of cognition and i think that sort of taken collectively that these kind of refute the idea that these, these these are just irreducible they're not that there's many components to them and and specific ways that they work and then when you combine that with the neuroscience side of things i think that then you really get a good case for actually this does look like it really is reducible to, to brain function um we never really got by the way an answer to the interaction problem which i think is a massive massive issue for any type of dualistic uh ontology which has the material and the mental now it seems that josh may have actually said that everything is fundamentally mental and that there's sort of different properties or aspects to that I, I don't i don't know enough about how he thinks that works to really comment there but i, I think that there are probably still going to be interaction issues regardless of uh, regardless of that because you still have to tell the story at some point about how neurons are causally affected by some immaterial substance that is not a neuron um and i think that I just don't see anyone making serious attempts to do that. Most people try to dodge this by saying, well, we don't need to answer that because we have theoretical reasons why it can't be, uh, for why like reductionism is false. So therefore, even if we can't answer the interaction problem, um, we, uh, it, it sort of doesn't matter. Or um, what I regard as sort of philosophical dodges of the issue. I, I actually don't like very abstract arguments about things like reduction or emergence. 
or uh, concepts like this, because I feel like that we just get really confused by these quite vague terms. I, I prefer, I mean, I'm not saying don't do the philosophy side of it. Obviously, I'm doing philosophy here and I like philosophy, but I think we need to think through the lens of our best sciences. Okay, so I want to know what effects do these extra substances have or processes or whatever they are? What are they doing to the neurons, right? Because we know that brain, brain activity is the result of complicated uh, networks of neural interactions. And we know that that gives rise to mental activity, at least in part, if not in whole. So how do these immaterial substances interact with neurons? Do they change ionic concentrations? Do they cause new neurotransmitters to be introduced? Do they add ion channels? Do they change the uh, like the properties of the electrical conductivity or something? Like, what what is happening there? And if none of that's happening, well, well then how is it affecting mental activity? Well, what is going on there? Um, I, I think there are absolutely enormous issues that that need to be addressed to try to make sense of how there's something beyond beyond the physical. And there are different, of course, there are different ways to try to address this. I think many of them are just unclear about what they actually add to our understanding. It's one of the reasons I'm pretty pro-reduction, like reduction scientific account, because I think that we can at least be clear about what we're, we're trying to explain and what's added to our understanding, as opposed to saying something like, well, there are irreducible properties that are non-physical properties, but nevertheless, they're, they're properties of physical things. So that's sort of some sort of um, a property dualist argument, which I just, I don't know. I, I feel like it's almost a verbal argument to get around a reductionist problem, which I, maybe I'm being unfair there. But but the point I'm making is I think we need to be clear about what our explanations are trying to do and how they relate to the, the underlying, um, what we think is the underlying biological reality of the system. How does it affect the neurons? So that, that's the way I would, I would phrase the question. Um, and I think there's one other thing I wanted to say. So this sort of came up in chat. I just sort of want to, want to comment on this. Um, we have to be careful about reification. So just because we have a word for something doesn't mean that there is some sort of um, there was some sort of specific physical object that corresponds to that thing. Okay, so for some things this is the case, and a rock is, I guess, the go-to example. So we have a word for a rock, and there do seem to be rocks that are just specific lumps of matter that are just there in a specific location that you can kick them. Right, that's a rock. So that's fine, right? Some things are a little tricky, maybe like a tree, because trees grow and they change over time more than more than maybe rocks do. But but you know, you'd still say a tree is a physical object, right? But but there are lots of words that we have that describe real things that nevertheless are not concrete physical objects. So a hurricane might be an interesting example. So what is a hurricane? I mean, a hurricane isn't the same thing as just a mass of air that makes up the hurricane, because it's got to be moving in the right way. It's got to have the right temperature and pressure properties, and it's got to be a certain. Uh, regions away from the equator and so forth so it's not just the air that makes it up it's the whole sort of system and the functions as that word again uh, between different parts of it and, and how that relates to the rest of the weather system okay what about an economy an economy is a set of transactions and institutions um prices and um and, and flows of goods and services right an economy is not a physical object you can't point at it you can't say it's there it's sort of spatially localized but it's not it's not at a particular point special one like the the, the uh, american economy is not on mars uh, but but you can't say exactly where it is right um you can't ask how big is the american economy in terms of like its physical size you could measure the size of it in terms of gdp but that's not physical size right so the point is we need to be really careful about reification here and it's sort of obvious if i say examples like the ones that i just used there but but for some reason it seems like consciousness or the mind people get a bit confused or at least some sometimes people do right because they, they seem to think that there's some sort of substance there like a thing a, a a physical object or maybe a non-physical object like a rock like consciousness isn't like a rock it's not a thing that you could go and kick or that you could discover it, it just by oh look here it is <laughs> uh it, it's it's more like an economy or it's more like a hurricane or it's more like life like uh, the biochemical reactions in, in cells that we call life it's more like these things highly complex interacting processes which have a physical instantiation but aren't the same thing as the physical instantiation. Just like you wouldn't really say that a hurricane is the same as the all the air molecules because air molecules themselves aren't enough to make the hurricane. They have to be interacting in the right way. Uh, uh, economy is even, even a bit trickier because it's not clear what you would say the substrate of that is. It's, a, it's people, but not everything about the person is relevant to the economy. It's their economic interactions with each other and institutions and so forth. Unless you want to say that, nah, economies don't really exist. They're just imaginary, which I... Well, you could go down that road, but I, I think that that's somewhat implausible. Um, then you want to say that 
an economy is a set of interactions, a, a label that we have for a very complicated set of things, a set of processes. It's not an object, right? <laughs> Life is not an object. It's a series of um, chemical reactions which manifest specific functions of, you know, growth and reproduction and resource, uh, seeking resources and, and energy and so forth. Um, it's not this fundamental particle that you find somewhere. So I, I don't know if this is sort of helpful, but I, I think that sometimes when people think about mind and consciousness, um, they, they maybe fall into the reification trap, which I think that maybe can, I'm not saying it's the only reason, but can lead you to think that there must be a fundamental thing that just is like consciousness and that has these properties just as sort of irreducible. Um, but, but to me, that would be like saying that there is an economy somewhere, like a fundamental thing that is the economy. <laughs> it's, I mean, to, uh, this is a bit crude, right? But actually the, the internet is a really good example of this. The internet is not a box that sits somewhere and that you can point at, like in that episode of the IT crowd for anyone who's seen that show, where there's a naive, uh, person who is tricked into thinking that this small black box is the internet. The internet is not one specific thing. It's a set of protocols. It's a set of uh, infrastructure um, connections between different computers. You could say the internet doesn't exist, but th that's going to be even more implausible to me than saying the economy doesn't exist. And and, and so the, the point is that there are all sorts of things that are complex that are defined functionally in terms of relations of parts and that are not single objects or, or things you can point to. Or, or, well, there it is, right? That you can't localize in the same way. Plenty of things are like that, and I think minds are like that. And I think that there's a mistake to want to identify minds or, or like mental activity with um, with some specific one thing. Uh, but but I think that if we if we reflect on how actually almost everything isn't like that, and certainly things we study you know scientifically aren't like that, um, it, it maybe can help us to look at consciousness or, or minds in a different way. I'm not saying that proves right that the minds are like that. But, but I'm suggesting that it's another way to think about it. And that's certainly how I think about it um, in terms of, you know, the, the very complicated interaction of different parts defined functionally in a particular system, uh, manifested in a particular way with particular substrate, blah, blah, blah. You know, you go and do the science behind it. Anyway, so hopefully hopefully that was helpful. I'm going to end it there. Um, I mean, this video wasn't as obnoxious as some of the ones that I've covered, but I think the arguments weren't very good. Um, and I think that there are certainly um, particularly more issues here that needed to be discussed with respect to the reliability of introspection, that's a major issue that I think needs to be discussed here uh, about exactly what the problem is with reductionist accounts in terms of, well, like, why, why can't you give this like process functional based reductionist account? I, I don't think we really saw very clear reasons for why that's impossible, despite the fact that it was claimed multiple times. The, the third main theme that I want to uh, focus on is the lack of clarity we've got about what an irreducible consciousness theory is supposed to add. What insight explanation do we get by postulating that? Um, it's well enough to say that reductionist and eliminative views have their problems, but what does the um, ineliminativist position about consciousness add to the picture? What does it help us understand? And I don't think it really helps us understand much of anything. I think it just adds more problems without providing any solutions. Okay, so that's all for today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Bear in mind that there's more content coming. Nathan and I is going to be doing about apologetics this weekend, covering... Uh, one of your best friends, Jordan Peterson. So please tune in for that. That's going to be very exciting. And going forward, I think we've got a few more bad apologetics planned. And of course, there's always going to be more content covering various videos like this one uh, that, that keep cropping up. So um, do stay tuned. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. Stay safe. Talk to you next time.